mics on, mics on. Uh, it is Wednesday, April 19th, 2023, and this is a regular session of the City of Bloomington Common Council. Uh, as we call to order, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Yes, Councilmember Flaherty? Here. Rosenbarger? Here. Sandberg? Here. Piedmont Smith? Here. Scambellori? Here. Rollo? Here. Sims? Here. Smith? Here. And Bowling? Here. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll continue with an agenda summation. We have one set of minutes to approve this evening from April 27th, 2022. We'll then move into reports, including reports from council members, reports from the mayor and city offices on the tax abatement for Hoosier Energy, any reports from council committees, and then we'll move into our first of two periods of public comment. We'll then take up appointments to boards and commissions. I believe we have at least one this evening. We'll then continue with legislation for second readings and resolutions. Included there are Ordinance 2304 to amend Title 20 of the Unified Development Ordinance of the Bloomington Municipal Code regarding technical corrections set forth in BMC 20. Also, Ordinance 23-05 to amend Title 20, the Unified Development Ordinance of the Bloomington Municipal Code regarding amendments and updates set forth in Bloomington Municipal Code 20.03, 20.05, and 20.07. Ordinance 23-06 to amend Title 20, Unified Development Ordinance of the Bloomington Municipal Code regarding amendments and updates set forth in Bloomington Municipal Code 20.04. Ordinance 23.07 to amend Title 20 of the Unified, Deve the Unified Development Ordinance of the Bloomington Municipal Code regarding amendments and updates set forth in BMC 20.06. We'll then move into legislation for first readings. Included there is Ordinance 23-08 to amend the Traffic Calming and Greenways Program incorporated by reference into Title 15, Vehicles and Traffic, of the Bloomington Municipal Code regarding amending the Traffic Calming and Greenways Program incorporated by reference into Bloomington Municipal Code Section 15.26.020. Also, we'll take up Ordinance 20, or we'll um, have the first reading of Ordinance 23-09 to amend Title II of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Administration and Personnel regarding the creation of a joint city-county human rights commission. We'll then move into our second period of public comment and we'll take up matters of council schedule before adjourning. So with that, we go to our approval of minutes. Madam President, I move that the uh, April 27th, 2022 regular session minutes be approved. Second. Are there any comments or corrections or changes? Okay, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, the ayes have it, and those, those minutes are approved. Let's continue into council member reports. We'll start on my far left with council member Volan. Just a reminder that uh, primary day is May 2nd. Please make sure you vote early at the 301 South Walnut, I think is the address of the old Napa building across from the bus station, or uh, on May 2nd at your precinct. Uh, everyone should vote, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Smith. I have no report this week, thank you. Councilmember Sims. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a little bit to say, so I'll have to go fast today. Um, uh, I think many of us have heard that the county commissioners suspended the Community Justice Response Committee today. Um, I haven't heard any other details, but what I'd really like to hear is an explanation as why. Um, not necessarily for rebuttal or discussion, but I'd like to know why and then why now? Um, next point. Um, we'd like to announce that poll workers are needed for election day on May the 2nd. Um, we need workers, or I'm sorry, I shouldn't say we. Workers are needed from both parties and coverage is done in bipartisan teams. Um, so you need to call Election Central and talk to a recruiter and they'll make sure that you get a place to help out on election day. Next item, I want to say thanks to Councilmember Isabel Piedmont Smith um, for her last week's commentary about the two black Tennessee House of Representatives that were expelled um, and they have since been reinstated. Um, but I just want to thank her for bringing that uh, uh, to the public. And I just want everyone to think about how really fragile sometimes our democracy 
can really, really be. Um, so thank you, as, uh, Council Member Piedmont Smith. And lastly, um, Black Lives Matter B-Town mailed out a questionnaire um, for mayoral, clerk, and city council candidates um, for their elected offices. Four candidates failed to respond to that questionnaire. Now the assessments of candidates' responses were rated by Black Lives Matter B-Town representatives. And per Black Lives Matter B-Town, the assessments are for informational purposes and are not endorsements. If you bear with me just for a second. Their statement with regard to um, non-participating candidates is as follows. There are a few candidates who, choose, who chose not to fill out our questionnaire. Regardless of the reason not submitting responses for this voter's guide, it shows disrespect to Bloomington voters. Further, since our organization supports and advocates for black and other systemically marginalized people, candidates' refusals to provide answers for this voter guide should remind us that the majority of the Bloomington political landscape landscape is built to sustain anti-black practices. It was made very clear the importance of this guide and those who we serve additionally. We reminded them multiple times and gave them seven full days to complete the questionnaire. We therefore render a strongly disagree assessment for each of the candidates who did not engage. Again, this is a quote for Black Lives Matter B-Town. It's not from Jim Sims. However, I will go a bit further. If you drive around Bloomington and you've been noticing like I have, uh, on businesses, many businesses, and on people's private property, you will see signage that says Black Lives Matter. You see that their mission is for anti-racist social action. I also saw on a media post from some individual, and what this comment was, it said, a questionnaire about 4% of the population is not a way to assess a candidate for mayor, and I'm assuming for any other elected office. 4%, I assume, is meant to identify Bloomington's black population. And I think technically it's more like 3.8, but that's not the point of this comment. Anti-racist awareness promoted by Black Lives Matter of B-Town is much more than black people and that population. The businesses such as the mill and such as some restaurants that post these signs are not black owned. They are people who support social action, anti-racist policies and non-discrimination. Black Lives Matter B-Town's awareness also includes those LGBTQ and I, all BIPOC and all marginalized populations. Now, I understand, um, and I had to fill one out the last election, um, it is pretty thorough. Um, and of the four people that I mentioned earlier that did not respond, I've had the pleasure of discussing with two of them. Um, and without going into any details, um, we do have commitments and obligations in life that sometimes um, gets in the way of some of the things we fully intend to do. Um, I will say that one of the people I talked with made it clear that this was not a political statement of any kind, um, was just busy and it was an oversight. The other person I discussed with and their comment was, I just didn't have time to write a thesis. I want everyone to understand that not responding to the questionnaire, and it's your choice, this is America, but this represents way more than black people. BLM, B-Town represents more than the black population. Monroe County NAACP represents more than the black community. We have advocates, we have people who oppose discrimination, people who oppose um, racist, uh, policies and wish to see that. So I am a little bit disappointed, um, the lack of response, 
um, even though I um, don't hold anyone at, um, and I intentionally didn't mention names, I don't think that's important, but I don't hold those folks at fault, particularly. Uh, but this is important being election season. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Council Member Rollo. I have no comment, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, I'd like to report um, as the council's uh, representative to the Solid Waste Management Board, I'd like to um, just summarize the study that was released this month um, by consultants regarding an anaerobic digester um, at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and you see a, a summary of the conclusions here. Um, let me try to explain what, what all those acronyms and everything means. Um, so this study was undertaken uh, to see if it would be feasible to install an anaerobic digester. So currently the, the, the organic matter that comes to um, the wastewater treatment plants is uh, processed aerobically, meaning it's, it's kind of uh, so, sorted out and it's just kind of left in the sun to, to, um, to, get, to get dried out and then it's hauled away. Um, so the study was to find out whether um, it would be uh, technically and financially feasible to instead use that organic matter to create energy. So um, the first finding here you see is that the Dillman Road wastewater treatment plant is the preferred location instead of the Blucher Pool plant, which is smaller and which is located um, at not, at, it's not on a major highway like Dillman Road and it doesn't have as much space on its property. So Dillman Road. Um, number two, uh, so some of the, um, the mechanical uh, additions and changes that would be needed for anaerobic digestion will benefit City of Bloomington utilities anyway. So um, this is what number two is saying, that those, prime, the high, uh, those grit removal and high filtration uh, additions would um, not only benefit what they're calling the resource recovery project, that's the project that was studied, but it would benefit operations in general. So number three, uh, volumes uh, of high, um, and now, now I'm blanking out, uh, high something organic waste. Oh my goodness, too many, too many acronyms, acronyms, uh, acronyms. Um, I'll have it for you in just a second. High strength, high strength organic waste is what that means. Um, and so the study showed that uh, if we have um, additional high strength organic waste in addition to what is already in our wastewater stream, um, then uh, we could generate revenues um, from tipping fees for people who bring that waste to um, utilities and it could increase uh, the biogas or the energy that could be produced. Um, so the two uh, alternatives for energy production are combined heat and power and renewable natural gas. So renewable natural gas is um, something that it can be processed from um, these organic wastes that can then be used to fuel vehicles, for example, or, or any other uses you, you may have for natural gas. Um, there are some buses that, that use um, RNG for fuel. But it's really, um, as far as greenhouse gas emissions, it's not the preferred way to go because there's still a high methane content um, in that RNG. So the um, CHP, the combined heat and power, is really the preferable way to go um, as far as uh, the environmental impacts. I'm sorry, I think that was my editorial statement. I don't think the study actually said that. But um, CHP has strong economic potential is what they showed. Number five. So. Even if you have an anaerobic digestion process, you're gonna end up with some, um, some solids at the end, some end product. And um, the end product here could be used as a class B land application, which means that it could be used in certain kinds of farming um, or um, amending the soil. Now it can't, it's not a class A, so it can't be used like in um, actually farming food, I believe, because it's not processed enough. Um, it's not uh, pure enough. Um, but a Class B land application is uh, a better alternative than just throwing the stuff in the landfill, which is being done now. 
Number six, um, recent tax credit legislation can offset up to, up to 50% of the eligible project costs. So that's pretty self-explanatory and it's good news. Um, the project has a potential to be cost neutral with sufficient high strength organic waste volumes using the tax credits and the environmental credits um, that are available to uh, the city. And those could also be available if we decide to partner with a private entity to build this. Um, and finally, the resource recovery program will directly address at least 10 different goals in the city's climate action plan and sustainability plan. And one thing that was discussed at the presentation last week is that um, there's, in order to meet those 10 goals, there's gonna be some expenditure of funds. Uh, so it's a matter of comparing um, the expense, uh, the investment, capital investment of uh, programs such as the anaerobic digester with other expenditures that would help us attain the goals um, equally quickly. So in that respect, this uh, anaerobic digester is, uh, seems to be a, a, good, a good idea to pursue. So I just wanted to review that. Um, I, the uh, Solid Waste Board meeting um, is available on CATS, and I'll also email the slides to um, my colleagues. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Sandberg. Yes, thank you. Uh, the Jack Hopkins Social Services Committee began its work last night, and we had 45 agencies apply this year. That was quite the banner number. Uh, we have 935,547 in requests, and of course, the Jack Hopkins Fund has 300. 23,000 in allocations to, to give out. So the decisions were quite difficult in uh, seeing who would be coming to the agency presentations, which will be April 27th at 530. Uh, we wish everyone well who is coming forward and uh, looking forward to another grant round. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rosenbarger. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, I want to take my report tonight to honor and remember David Howard, who passed away on April 10th. I want to express gratitude for getting to know him. Sorry, my computer just messed up. And for the work he has done in our community. David always had a million things going on at once, and I want to acknowledge some of the great work he did for housing and economic development in downtown. One of his first projects, David rehabbed the Sullivan Building on North Washington Street, adding two stories to the building, a positive example of incremental and infill development. David was a visionary for change. He built on South Walnut, adding density with a couple of plexes and commercial space along one of our corridors. David and his business partner developed Alley Works on West 6th Street, which includes 33 downtown apartments, Nourish Bar, Brilliant Coffee, and Capiche Market. On top of Alley Works, David built Bloomington's first live roof in 2019. David was seen as an energizer bunny, a force of nature, and wildly productive. He was a foodie who brought awesome chefs and delicious food to his restaurants, from the best gelato and in-house roasted coffee to lobster spring rolls. He played the cello, he minored in cello performance, in quartets around town for almost 20 years, and he co-owned First Light Farms, growing organic mushrooms and microgreens. David could identify community needs and figure out how to provide for them from small-scale developments to mushrooms. One of the many wonderful things about David was he loved dreaming big with his clients and business partners. Anything you could think of, he responded with, oh yeah, we can do that. His death is a tragic loss, and my heart is with his friends, family, and all of those impacted. A memorial service for David will be held at Allen Funeral Home from 1 to 3 p.m. Sunday, April 30th. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Flaherty. Thank you. Um, I just want to echo the sentiments that Council Member Rosenberger shared. Uh, David was a terrific human, and uh, I'll be missed. Um, I also wanted to uh, mention um, my constituent meeting, which is uh, Monday, April 24th, uh, 5.30 p.m. You can uh, access details to the Zoom meeting at uh, bloomington.in.gov slash council. Um, also, happy Earth Week to folks, and Earth Day is coming up this Saturday, April 22nd. Uh, the city has a celebration taking place at Switchyard Park from 1 to 5 p.m. Um, there will be food and drink vendors, uh, also celebrating kickoff of Bike Month. There's raffle prizes, and also the uh, Indiana nonprofit called Greater Indiana is uh, coming to showcase EVs, 
and um, a variety of uh, electric vehicles, uh, chargers, uh, talk about incentives for EV ownership, and, and we'll have experts on hand to answer questions. Um, also, I uh, was excited to, to hear the report from um, my colleague, Isabel Piedmont-Smith. Uh, I've been excited about that study and um, all the due diligence going into the wastewater treatment plant uh, resource recovery plan for quite a while. I was also excited to learn that uh, combined heat and power is the uh, recommendation from the study. I think that's, that's absolutely the way to go. As some folks know, um, the wastewater treatment and city of Bloomington Utilities is the largest electricity consumer in, the, um, in Monroe County, uh, and that's not just governmental, among all um, entities. And um, it's, I think, so, I want to explain how it works just a little bit, because <laughs> I, I want to explain how this really is a lot better than aerobic digestion. Uh, which just basically releases CO2 directly into the air with no benefit. Now we're going to capture that CO2 through anaerobic digestion, and instead of generating CO2, it's going to be methane, CH4. But instead of piping that methane anywhere where it might leak, which is the downside that um, uh, Councilmember Piedmont Smith uh, referenced, we're keeping it on site, combusting it, and releasing that same CO2 that would have been released anyway, but instead generating electricity that will power the plant. Uh, so that displaces fossil fuel generation that we're currently being supplied by Duke Energy, who's not in any great hurry to decarbonize. Uh, so it's a really, really impactful project uh, for the city and for our own climate goals. Um, it's been done successfully among a, a variety of cities in northern Indiana, including Fort Wayne. Uh, so it's, it's great to see that um, coming this way. And one final note on that. I believe the tax credit legislation uh, is taking advantage of, of a recent change under the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and Inflation Reduction Act, which is really also really meaningful for our potentially really meaningful for our community, which is that those tax credits used to have, have to have tax liability to take advantage of them, which required either a for-profit entity or complex sort of tax equity investor relationships that complicated uh, investments in things like renewables. But now there is a direct pay option for municipalities as well as uh, for nonprofit entities like um, Hoosier Energy, for instance, uh, the, the nonprofit um, member cooperative uh, that, that uh, operates in a lot of the rural uh, parts around our community and surrounding counties. Uh, so that's a really impactful uh, piece of the federal legislation, uh, climate legislation from the last year that will help uh, cities like ours as well as nonprofits in our community. Uh, and that is it for me. Thanks. Thank you. And I'll finish up. I'd just like to acknowledge the very, very good work done um, this past weekend at the Fritz Terrace Neighborhood Cleanup. Um, thanks to John Zodi and his staff in Housing and Neighborhood Development, our Public Works staff, our sanitation staff, and especially to the dozens of volunteers in Fritz Terrace. Uh, who actually worked on that and put in scores and scores of volunteer hours uh, to collect everything from scrap metal to branches to tradable items. Um, it was, it was uh, an excellent day and an impressive day, and just bravo to all those who did that work. So thank you, everyone. Uh, that takes us to reports from the mayor and city offices, and I believe we have all received a memo from Economic and Sustainable Development uh, regarding the Hoosier Energy tax abatement. And I believe we have Mr. Crowley with us. Thank you, uh, Council uh, President Scambellari. Yes, Alex Crowley, Director of Economic Sustainable Development. Before I get going with this, a couple of things. Uh, I wanted to thank Council Member Flaherty for his uh, promotion of Earth Day um, and the, the event happening at Switchyard on April 22nd. I encourage everybody to go out. The weather Looks like it's going to be okay, so uh, we were worried about it, but it looks like it's going to be a really great event. Um, it's a, it's a it's an, a collaboration between the efforts of the Transportation Demand Management F, um, uh, Project and sustainability, and it should be a lot of fun. Another great example of ESD's collaboration, in fact, um, is uh, something that that is initiated by uh, students at Bloomington High School South. It's called Samsung Solve for Tomorrow. And I would encourage people to Google that and vote for Bloomington High School South. Um, it's a terrific project. Uh, Holly in our department has been involved in placing that mural uh, near Wonder Lab. So vote, uh, you can vote once a day. So I would encourage you again, it's called Samsung Solve for Tomorrow and they've created a, a white paint that uh, reduces heat. Um, so it's this really cool project and just check out the video. So I wanted to promote that if I could, but I digress, and uh, today's uh, item is the, the Hoosier Energy Rural Electric Cooperative Tax Abatement. 
Um, let me quickly explain why we're coming to you today in the way we are. As you may recall, typically we come to you once a year uh, in mid to late June to review every tax abatement that has been put in front of us and that is ongoing to evaluate whether or not a uh, recipient is meeting the expectations of the tax abatement. And um, those are submitted to us in a process that involves, uh, involves a form that is due on May 15th. And then the council has 45 days to evaluate and if necessary, pursue additional information, uh, approve or otherwise deal with these submissions. The, the challenge and problem with, with the process is that if someone submits a form early, um, the 45 day clock starts. And that is the case here. Hoosier uh, Energy has submitted early, which means that the 45 day clock would expire before we had the opportunity to present to you uh, following the May 15th deadline. So we're coming to you early, somewhat atypically. Uh, Hoosier Energy has done a, a great job submitting, uh, but unfortunately they did it early. So we have to come to you a little bit out of process in order to give you the opportunity to react to this in advance of the termination of the 45 day period. So hopefully that's clear. And the memo that, that we put together, and it's a special thanks to Dee De La Rosa and, and my department for doing this, summarizes our evaluation of their submission this year. Hoosier Energy has been consistently um, exceeding expectations when it comes to the tax abatement. So uh, it's a good example of a well-placed, well-judged tax abatement. It is in year six of its 10-year tax abatement. You'll see in the memo, a couple of highlights. Hoosier Energy was formed in 1949. It's owned by 18 rural electric cooperatives. In 2013, the EDC approved Resolution 12, the Economic Development Commission, I should say, approved Resolution 1202. And then um, Common Council then followed up with a tax, a 10 year tax abatement approval uh, in, in 2013 with uh, Resolution uh, 1303. So they have this terrific, if you haven't seen it, a terrific property, LEED certified headquarters on the southwest side of Bloomington. Again, they're in year six. We looked at what they had originally promised, how they have met those uh, commitments, and it is our recommendation to you that, and, and we will make this formally also in June, but that given the limitation in, in um, uh, the 45 day period, it's our recommendation to you that we feel like they are solidly meeting the expectation and, um, and we wanted to share that with you today. Thank you. Let's come to council. Are there questions? Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes. Do, does Hoosier Energy actually produce energy, or do they just distribute? And if so, how do they produce the energy? That is, <laughs> you've asked me a question that I will need to follow up with you on. Um, my understanding is owned actually by. Um, cooperatives, so the REMCs, right? So it's a kind of consolidator of that. And I I, I want to say that they are redistributing that energy, uh, but I will need to uh, get back to you about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? Okay. Council Member Smith? Thank you, Mr. Crowley. Uh, uh, can you... Uh, Tell us the number of jobs that, I know that there's always jobs that are attached to, to the abatements. Um, so for over this period, uh, it says there's looks like uh, plus 29 jobs. W what was the target uh, for the yeah, abatement? Great question. So yes, this, this tax abatement was a combination of a commitment to capital investment and to, and to jobs. In this case, it was actually retained jobs at the time of the original approval. Uh, the capital investment was a $20 million investment. The retained jobs at the time of the original approval was 116 jobs. They have exceeded that and are now at 145 jobs. They've also exceeded their capital investment by $800,000. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. 
Thank you. Additional questions? Okay. No. Council member, ooh, I'm sorry. Council member Flaherty. Not a question, but I could answer Council member Piedmont Smith's question if that's helpful. Um, so there's two types of cooperatives. There's generation and transmission cooperatives, and there's distribution cooperatives. The former is what Hoosier Energy is, and they are basically a cooperative of cooperatives, as Mr. Crowley indicated. So the distribution co-ops are the ones who actually interact with um, the customers, bill them, and uh, set the rates and that sort of thing. They get their power from the generation and transmission co-ops. So those GNTs, as they're called, like Hoosier Energy, uh, that are made up of all the distribution co-ops, uh, they're the ones that procure the power. So they're building generation assets and then probably also buying power off the um, off power, power markets, essentially. So we'll have a combination of those two things. Um, I don't know what their current mix is. I know they've got a fair amount of renewable initiatives, but it's doubtless still a mix of um, gas at the least and probably some coal as well. I think they describe it as an all of the above uh, portfolio. Um, but that's the basic structure of how the cooperatives serve energy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Additional questions? Okay. And Mr. Lucas, do you have any other contextual comments? I, I, if I remember correctly, there is no specific action required at this time? Yes, I think that's correct. Mr. Crowley mentioned that if the council were to have concerns about this, there's a 45-day window to uh, take steps to uh, get more information from the uh, uh, property owner and possibly uh, uh, rescind the abatement. Uh, if that's not uh, the will of the council tonight, you don't need to do anything uh, unless the council takes steps to rescind this abatement. They'll they'll be able to receive their uh, their abatement. And again, Mr. Crowley mentioned this will also be uh, included as part of the annual tax abatement report that you'll you'll be getting in the next uh, couple of months. Okay. Council Member Volan. So just to be clear, um, normally we get this report on May fifteenth, and we'd have until June thirtieth. Um, is is the forty five days starting today or when? ESD received the report, Mr. Crowley? It's actually when uh, the, uh, good question, it's actually when the, the council uh, received the, the uh, what's called a CF1, which is the annual reporting mechanism that requ that is required of recipients of tax abatements. And um, we've actually received another one, but it was mistakenly sent to us. And so we can actually hold that and not have to start that clock until the time comes and then make sure that it starts. Um, but in this case, this was sent to you, to the council office, and because of that, it triggers that 45-day that, um, uh, uh, clock. And I believe the end date is April 28th, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so there's not really a lot of time. We got it back in March, and we're only now taking it up. Is that right, Mr. Lucas? I believe it was filed with the, the clerk's office. They typically receive these forms on behalf of the council. Uh, so it was, uh, there was a little bit of time before uh, anyone realized, oh, this had started the clock. Uh, in that time, we worked with uh, ESD to see how they wanted to handle this early filer. It's my understanding that ESD tries to communicate with uh, the property owners to uh, essentially not start the clock for the council. Uh, they can file these forms early with ESD, uh, and then they can hold them and prepare one big report so that we're not having to do this in a piecemeal fashion. Just out of curiosity, to either of you, was there a reason that they decided to file early? Do I think know? they're just uh, very on top of their game, and uh, we, we do appreciate that. It does create a little complication for us, um, but uh, I think they just were getting it done. Okay. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you. Anything, anything additional? Okay. Mr. Crowley, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. That takes us to reports from council committees. I'm not aware of any, but that doesn't mean there aren't any. So, Seeing none, let's continue to our first period, first of two periods of public comment. Okay. Uh, this is for items not on the agenda. Uh, could I have a show of hands in chambers of those who would like to offer comment? Thank you. If you would like to approach the podium. And Mr. Lucas, could you extend our invitation on Zoom, please? Yes, if there are members of the public on Zoom that would like to comment, please let us know by raising your hand in Zoom. You can find that raise hand button in your control bar under the reactions tab or the more tab. You can also send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to speak. And if you would, please approach the podium and please sign in. And then state your name for the record and you'll have five minutes. 
Good evening. My name is Sean Hall. My mother is the Salt Creek Township trustee and I sit on the township board. I would like to address the city's housing affordability crisis and the effect it has on the township. Because the cost of living is so high in Bloomington, it pushes people into the township, which drives up costs there. Our constituents can't afford to pay their rent, so they come to the township for aid. Essentially, taxpayers in our township are subsidizing the city's inability to control housing costs. This is not acceptable. It's not sustainable. The township does not have a bottomless pot of money. Recently, we had a low-income constituent who, because they were unable to find affordable housing in Bloomington, was forced to live in a camper at Payne Town State Recreational Area with two small children. Think about that. Two small children are living in a camper. That is an abomination. That should never happen. If this body does not know how to address the exorbitant cost of housing, I suggest to take a look at Missoula, Montana, which like Bloomington is a liberal college town in a red state. That city is in the process of rewriting its building and zoning codes. One of the primary goals of their code reform is to streamline and simplify code, which will allow them to make even more headway on permit review timelines, alongside reducing the review times for all other land use review without needing to add significant capacity to their planning team. Missoula Mayor Jordan Hess, speaking at a recent City Club Missoula Forum, said code reform will be transformative. Quote, it doesn't sound very sexy, he said, but it's probably the most impactful thing that we can do to improve the livability of our community and the affordability of housing for the next generation. A recent study from Pew Trust found that, quote, that rents rise and more people need housing relative to how many homes are available. Restrictive zoning policies make it harder and more expensive to build new housing for everyone who wants it, and most researchers have found that this drives up home prices and rents. But what happens to rents after new homes are built? Studies show that adding new housing supply slows rent growth, both nearby and regionally, by reducing competition among tenants for each available home, and thereby lowering displacement pressures. There are solutions to the housing affordability crisis. This body simply needs to avail itself of them. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Mr. Lucas, do we have anyone on Zoom? Yes, uh, first is Jim Shelton. Okay. Mr. Shelton, welcome. If you would confirm your name for the record and then you'll have five minutes. Uh, yes, this is Jim Shelton. Good evening, Council. I'm representing the Bloomington Chamber of Commerce, but speaking at the moment on behalf of Court Appointed Special Advocates or CASA. It's that time of year for CASA to have their spring training session. It will be in just about a month. It'll start on May 22nd and run through June 14th. It'll be on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday evenings from 5.30 to 8.30. Uh, the application deadline is May 5th. So you've got just a few weeks to decide if maybe this is a volunteer opportunity for you or not and to get your application in. You can go online to MonroeCountyCasa.org, click on the volunteer link, and you can find a lot of information about being a CASA, what the CASA does, how, when the trainings are, et cetera, if you can't remember what I said. And you can download and fill out an application, or you can fill it out online and just submit it. For those who don't know, a CASA is a court-appointed special advocate they uh, have been trained by the volunteers, been trained by the CASA professionals. It would be about 33 hours of training. Then they would be sworn in by Judge Harvey and uh, would be in effect an, an officer of the court and would represent children who are in the justice system, not because of anything they've done, but because of their parents, things they've done or not done. Uh, when children's uh, are determined to have been abused or neglected by their parents, the court will reach out to the CASA program and ask to assign a volunteer to work with the child while the child is in the court system. You would be the eyes and ears of the court. You would visit the child monthly. You would visit with the parents, with the foster situation or wherever the child is uh, being placed. And you uh, work with providers if the child is old enough to be receiving services in the school system, if that's uh, if the child is old enough for that. And then when the court's going to have a hearing, uh, depending which the time uh, between hearings varies, but at least twice a year, uh, you would be uh, asked to re 
uh, write a report and be at the court and uh, perhaps ask questions about your report. So the judge has the most information that she can, or he, mostly it's uh, Judge Harvey at the moment, uh, to decide the best things to do to for the good of the child. What kind of services the child might need? How's the child doing? Uh, is the uh, place the child is working out well for them? Are they safe? Have there been any problems? And then you would also provide status on how the parents are doing. When uh, the child is determined to be a CHINS, a C-H-I-N-S, a child in need of services, the parents will be given a, a bunch of, a, a list of things they need to do, a disposition order is called, to be reunited with their children. And you would help monitor how they're doing and how let the court know how things are going. A typical case will run a couple of years. So we ask that people who uh, decide to volunteer for this be able to commit to that. And one of the things that ACASA does that uh, the Department of Child Services has trouble doing is providing continuity throughout that period of time. They have an awful lot of turnover. I've had a case which had uh, went about three years and had five different uh, family case managers on it from DCS. And there is also a lot of turnover in the uh, uh, provider community. So you would end up often being the only constant to this child other than their foster placement. And quite frankly, sometimes uh, there'll be two or three of those during the course of a case. So you would be the constant in the child's life and uh, sort of be a rock that they can depend on and feel and know they're all, that you're gonna always be there well, they're worried that maybe their parents won't. So it's a great volunteer opportunity. I encourage people to think about it, look into it, uh, get an application in. You do need to be 21. You need to be able to commit to about eight to 15 hours a month. And it's very rewarding when you get to the end of a case and you've been uh, a contributor to getting the child back into a good, safe, permanent situation, either back with their parents who have uh, straightened out their ship, if you will, or have been, uh, the course, determined that they need to be adopted. So I want to bring that word to everybody, and thank you guys for the opportunity to spread the word. Thank you, Mr. Shelton. Let's come here in council chambers next. If you would, please sign in and state your name for the record, and then you'll have five minutes. Good evening. I want to thank the council for the opportunity to speak to you tonight and also thank Mr. Hall for his comments because my comments tonight are also about housing. My name is Deborah Meyerson. I'm a member of the Advocacy Committee for the South Central Housing Network. And as city council members start to think about the budget for next fiscal year, I'd like to encourage you to look at the city's comprehensive plan uh, adopted in 2018, particularly Chapter 5 on housing and neighborhoods. And as you review this chapter, I encourage you to consider what have we accomplished in the last five years? What needs more attention? And what needs revision? And finally, how can the vision for housing and neighborhoods in the comprehensive plan be reflected in next year's budget? I encourage you to think about these as new fiscal year resolutions and look at some ha selected housing specific items in the comp plan. I'm just gonna mention a few goals just to refresh on that. Um, one includes goal 5.1, which is housing affordability, including access to affordable housing for a continuum of needs in Bloomington, including people experiencing homelessness, low income, moderate income households, and striving for permanent affordability in both rental and owner occupied housing options. And that includes expanding and sustaining housing programs designed to serve the identified long-term housing affordability needs of these to achieve an income diverse and inclusive city and establishing affordable housing in locations with close proximity to schools, employment centers, transit, recreational opportunities, and other community resources. Housing supply help to meet the current and projected regional housing needs of all economic and demographic groups by increasing Bloomington's housing supply with infill development, reuse of residential development land, of non-residential developed land, and developments on vacant land, neighborhood stabilization, promoting a variety of home ownership and rental housing options, and promoting and maintaining housing options within neighborhoods to ensure a diversity of housing types 
a mix of household incomes, and a variety of home ownership and rental opportunities. And then finally, I'll comment on programs that cover affordable housing, which the comprehensive plan addresses, including evaluating the range of housing types and income levels throughout the city to identify opportunities where greater diversity in income and housing types should be encouraged, working with the Bloomington Housing Authority to ensure ample affordable community housing options are available to BHA clients, including but not limited to public housing, Section 8 housing choice vouchers, and Section 8 project-based vouchers, and in particular, partnering with Monroe County government to coordinate and maximize affordable housing strategies and leverage available resources. There's certainly many outcomes and indicators I encourage you to look at in the comprehensive plan that relate to these. How are we measuring these? Because if you measure it, you can measure progress. And if there isn't progress, you will know that. Um, and finally, I'd like to encourage you to also consult other resources that have been produced since the comprehensive plan was uh, issued in, in, and approved by the council in 2018. And this includes the Heading Home Strategic Plan, the Bloomington UDO, which you will be looking at amendments to tonight, so continuing to keep those two closely coordinated. The comprehensive plan should be consistent with the UDO and vice versa. Um, the Housing and Neighborhood Development or HAN Department's Consolidated Plan. And then the analysis of impediments to fair housing choice for the city of Bloomington. And finally, the Bloomington Housing Study, which was published in 2020. All of those are relevant and important to improving housing conditions and affordability in the city. And uh, I encourage you to look at how to coordinate those so that they are in alignment with each other. Finally, I hope to see you all on Monday evening where there will be a city council learning session that is hosted by the Heading Home Coalition of South Central Indiana. It'll be at the Monroe County Convention Center at 7 p.m. And I will be there to talk with you then as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Meyerson. Mr. Lucas, do we have anyone else on Zoom? Not at this time, no. And is there anyone else in chambers? Okay. Seeing none, that'll conclude our first period of public comment. We have a second period of public comment coming up later in the meeting. But for now, that will take us to appointments to boards and commissions. Are there any to be brought before this body? Council Member Flaherty. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam President, on behalf of Interview Committee B, I would like to move the following appointments to the Community Advisory and Public Safety Commission. Carolyn Leinenbach to seat C7 and Tyler Schaefer to seat C9. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Thank you, the ayes have it. And thank you to Ms. Leinenbach and to Mr. Schaefer for their willingness to serve. We appreciate it very much. So that takes us to legislation for second readings and res re resolutions. Sorry. Madam President, I move that Ordinance 2304 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Madam Clerk, will you please read? Ordinance 2304 to amend Title 20 Unified Development Ordinance of the Bloomington Municipal Code regarding technical corrections set forth in Bloomington Municipal Code 20. The synopsis is as follows. This petition contains corrections or clarifications in the UDO. These errors range from missing references to terminology correction to missing text to sinking references across the UDO. There are 19 amendments identified, some appearing multiple times in the code. Madam President, I move that Ordinance 2304 be adopted. Thank you. And I believe we have Ms. Scanlon with us tonight or Mr. Robinson? I'm here, it's me. Oh, you're Sorry. over there. <laughs> you moved. So. Thank you. Jackie Scanlon, Development Services Manager, uh, Planning and Transportation. And um, we have four ordinances to get through tonight. This is the first. Um, and so I will be taking you through those. Let's see. Okay, so this first ordinance was seen by Plan Commission um, at its March hearing under case number Z0423, and they voted to send the petition to the Common Council um, with a positive recommendation uh, with a vote of 9-0. So just by way um, 
of uh, RECAP, Planning and Transportation Department. It has been doing annual updates to the Unified Development Ordinance, as you know, uh, which is Title 20 of the Bloomington Municipal Code. Um, the last regular update being done in spring of 2022. Um, and uh, this being another version of a regular maintenance code update um, without um, large um, uh, policy changes. No changes to permitted uses or zoning districts are included in any of the updates I'll discuss tonight. So this is the first, um, again, Ordinance 23-04, and this is the one we refer to um, as technical corrections. So I am going to uh, go through the red line of what those are and then I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, so um, you can see here, I, I believe we talked about this last time, but um, uh, when we do updates to the Word document, sometimes it updates the links. So you'll see a number of these updates. For example, here it says development standards and incentives, and then it just says development standards and incentives directly next to it. Nothing has changed in the content of those. When you see a link like that that's updated, uh, that's just something that Word does. Um, so those are not uh, changes that we are proposing uh, for some reason. I believe it has to do with the link and the page number that it goes to, and so it, it updates automatically uh, when you work on a large document like this. Um, so our first update uh, here is that, again, these are uh, mostly, these are all technical, um, so mostly corrections and clarifications, um, as was read by the clerk. Uh, here's our first example. You can see uh, downtown character overlay was listed twice um, in the uh, district table, so we're just taking away one of those labels. Um, and then here, the next few pages uh, is our new TRO section and then more. Um, and that these are just uh, spelling errors um, that were left in, letters missing, um, and that is what is on those pages that I just went through. And then when we get here, these are kind of hard to see. For example, here there's uh, an extra space between this word. So again, this ordinance is very much just a cleanup ordinance. Uh, we ran the uh, spell check on this, which we, I guess, had not done in the previous years. <laughs> so it caught a number of, for example, extra period on this page. Uh, this page is included because of an extra space. Um, uh, extra spaces here on this page as well. Misspelled word on this page. Uh, in this case, this is slightly more substantive. Uh, these are two different regulations listed here as D and E, and they had at some time been combined into one, um, but uh, are to function separately. So moving the text of the second portion into its own um, letter here under E, is what we're doing on page 32. Uh, an extra numeral here on page 33. And then this one, you, what you are looking at in this ordinance on this page is only the vision clearance update. So under D, uh, we had a formatting error last year, on last year's update, I believed, where um, a number of the vision clearance references, uh, something was inserted into them that was incorrect. So this cleans that up. Um, so you see that here. The other two, the other changes you see through E, um, E, F, and then the strike through, you'll see those uh, in a different ordinance. It's just one large um, red line document. So all we're looking at on this page in this ordinance is that vision clearance update. And then the next few pages are um, renumbering these tables. So that's what's happening um, with this update. Again, we'll talk about the content of these tables under an, uh, another ordinance later this evening, but what's happening here is the renumbering. You can see here on page 50 uh, that this is another vision clearance correction. More table numbering on page 51. An extra punctuation on page 52. Another vision clearance uh, error on page 53 and one on page 54. Um, taking out the word non-residential here in the reference uh, because that is not um, the way that it is uh, defined. That's not the term that is defined, so syncing that with the existing defined term. And then um, punctuation space here for district. 
on page 56, swapping a that for a than on page 57, another table number here on page 58. And where, let's see. Oh, this is also um, an actual change. So this is um, the code reference that is crossed out for 2007 is from the old code. So updating that code reference here. An extra space on page 60, uh, extra space on 61, and 62, and 63. So again, a number of just typographical errors. Um, here where uh, you can see that a reference source um, was not linked, so putting in that link um, for that location here. And then we go to our definition section. Uh, this is taking out the sentence at the end of a definition for buffer yard, indicating that a buffer yard is in addition to and separate from uh, setbacks. That is something that lives in another chapter that we are proposing to remove um, with another update. So this would be syncing with that proposal. Um, we are also proposing, here's a reference to a graphic that doesn't exist taking out the definition for mixed tenant center because that is not something um, that appears in code. And taking out uh, parking garage structure because that is a duplicated definition with um, our vehicle garage. And then clarifying here for awning sign that those are regulated as wall signs. And then for uh, use change in, there are two changes. Um, one is uh, clarifying that um, change in use is not something that we apply when an individual tenant center in a single multi-tenant, excuse me, an, an individual tenant space in a single multi-tenant center switches out. We don't apply change in use regulations and then updating the term as well in number seven to multi-tenant center. And that is all we have for this. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Let's come to council for questions. Council member Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, on page 64 of our packet, um, uh, under thresh <clears throat> thresholds for minor and major site plan review, um, and here at the first part, minor site plan review, there's an item number five that's deleted. Can you tell me why that is being sure. deleted? Sure, so that will actually appear in the um, another ordinance later this evening that won't be approved with this particular ordinance. Um, but the reason that it's excluded is as we've updated the, um, as we've updated the thresholds difference for major and minor site plan, this is kind of a carryover from the old code and it is incorporated in, in all of the other options. So um, it is incorporated in the uh, one, two, three, and four above. There is, there is not a situation where five could be triggered and one of the other um, triggers would not also be triggered. But you will see that when we discuss chapter, the chapter six update. So okay. for this ordinance, it's only the um, code reference uh, under minor site plan review um, that is going forward with this particular ordinance. The other items that you see under five and seven will come forward later tonight. Okay. Maybe you could explain a little further before sure. we get to that point. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? Seeing none, let's go to public comment. Uh, for anyone who has public, who wishes to offer comment on Ordinance 2304, please approach the podium. Mr. Lucas, can you extend our invitation on Zoom, please? Yes, if there are uh, folks joining us via Zoom that would like to speak on this ordinance, please let us know by raising your hand in Zoom. You can find that under your control bar by clicking the Reactions tab or the More tab. You can also send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to speak. Okay. I'm not seeing any comments here in Chambers. Mr. Lucas, any takers on Zoom? No. Okay. Seeing none, let's come back to Council for additional questions or comments. Seeing none, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll on Ordinance 23-04. Councilmember Flaherty? 
Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Sims? Yes. Smith? Yes. And Bowling? Yes. Thank you. That passes 9 0. Madam President, I move that Ordinance 2305 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been moved and seconded. On the motion to introduce, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Madam Clerk. Ordinance 2305 to amend Title 20 Unified Development Ordinance of the Bloomington Municipal Code regarding amendments and updates set forth in BMC 2003, 2005, and 2007. The synopsis is as follows. This petition contains amendments related to use regulations in Chapter 3, subdivision standards in Chapter 5, and definitions in Chapter 7 of the UDO. There are 61 amendments identified. Madam President, I move that Ordinance 2305 be adopted. Second. Thank you. Ms. Scanlon. Thank you. Uh, the Planning Commission heard um, case Z0523 again at its March 6, 2023 hearing and voted to forward the petition to the Common Council with a positive recommendation with a vote of 9-0 as amended. The Plan Commission voted to remove um, the proposed changes to 2003-010-E1 um, in order to have time for additional information to be gathered. Um, so tonight what you are seeing, uh, as was stated, are changes to Chapter 3, 5, and 7. Um, so Chapter 3 is our use regulations chapter of Title 20, Chapter 5 is subdivision standards, and Chapter 7 is definitions. So the change in Chapter 3 um, related to use specific standards for use as allowed in the code. The amendments relate to changes to rules for vehicle fuel stations, outdoor storage, self-storage facility design, and the process for ADU paperwork when no building permit is required. The amendment for Chapter 5 deals with clarifying how to regulate existing structure and structures involved on land that is being subdivided or otherwise altered. And the Chapter 7 amendments are related to clarifying how to define basement, footprint, average surface grade, and landscape area in line with how they are currently regulated. Um, and then there are a number of changes related to uh, the State of Indiana Floodplain Regulation Administration that we are responsible for. Um, so that they are very varied. Uh, and so I will go through those again uh, similarly as before. And you can let me know if you have any questions. So the first is uh, we have been advised by the legal department to remove the use specific standards for fraternity or sorority, uh, which were added um, a number of years ago um, in response um, or in relation to some litigation. And now uh, we have been informed that it's their moot and so they don't need to be in code anymore. So we are proposing to remove those. That's on page 78. Um, on page 79, um, for fuel, the use fuel, vehicle fuel station in the ME zoning district had a number of regulations related to the design of the structures for such a use, and we are proposing that those be uh, extended to all zoning districts. So that is what the change at the bottom of 79, and then here at the top of 80, um, G and H would now apply to um, all zoning districts. Uh, they previously were um, under the heading for ME zoning district only. Uh, next, we are going to one of our um, uses that we often are involved with uh, in enforcement, um, which is outdoor storage, and clarifying here under C that it does apply to all zoning districts, uh, not just to those uh, where the use is allowed. That's something we maybe need to make a bigger change for um, in the future, but at this time, uh, with legal guidance, we're making this change uh, to clarify that um, it can be enforced in all zoning districts. All right, here on page 82, um, we are revising this language so that it, for, um, excuse me, for self-storage design language, uh, requiring two-story structures um, that were previously required only in some of the mixed-use districts uh, will now be required in all uh, zoning districts where the use is allowed. 
for accessory dwelling units. Uh, currently, the code says a request for an ADU shall be required to submit a separate site plan petition with the Planning and Transportation Department. Um, we usually see the site plan through a building permit, um, and so that kind of ticks that box. We want to clarify that if there's no building permit necessary, for example, if someone already has the accessory dwelling unit uh, and is just wanting to legitimize it, um, that we would still request that we receive a site plan from them so we could verify um, the size requirements um, and other requirements. So just codifying that. Okay, so this portion is um, adds new language to reflect, this is the chapter five change, adding new language to reflect situations where an existing developed lot um, is being uh, split apart. So basically what we come into, the situation would be if you were on a lot that had enough room to be more than one lot and your building didn't meet side yard setbacks and you were proposing to subdivide the lot but not, not involving that line that that line and that encroachment is staying, but you're doing a subdivision on the other side of your property. Right now, it's kind of unclear whether or not you need to get a variance for that existing encroachment because you're creating a new lot and uh, we code requires that new lots meet code requirements. So this allows that if you have an existing encroachment and it isn't being affected at all by your subdivision, that it can remain without you having to legitimize it in some other way. Uh, which we think is appropriate, and we, you know, we see that quite a bit. Um, so, kind of making that a little bit easier for people to do. Okay, I am not going to go through all of these in detail. Uh, most of these pages are um, definition changes related to the guidance that we got from the state. So, um, the DNR provides information to us uh, about and they have a model code. So you have seen that. We, up, we updated to their model code a number of years ago, and then they updated again. So we are now um, updating our code to meet their requirements uh, so that we can be a community that offers flood, flood insurance. Um, so we have to be uh, updated to their uh, model code standards. So most of the... Um, most of the changes to Chapter 7 are related to that, and then you will see that again in Chapter 4. There are a handful that aren't, so I will call those out, and then um, I, I or someone can try to answer questions if you have floodplain questions. Um, the one that, we, one that we are adding is for basement. We are adding the phrase and number of stories. <clears throat> so a basement shall be counted as a story for determining building setbacks and numbers of stories if, and then there's a description basically for a basement that's visible. That's important to add because uh, when we did the code update, we changed from height only to height and stories for our regulations, so we need to know whether or not we're counting that level as a story uh, when we're talking about maximums. So just adding that phrase in there. And then let's see here. So you will see other uh, changes on these pages I'm passing, but they are all related to um, uh, meeting the floodplain definition requirements. Our next definition change is for the term footprint. Um, so just changing a little bit of the verbiage here uh, to talk about structures that don't have walls. So instead of the absence of surrounding exterior walls, changing it to just directly say buildings or structures with no walls. Um, again, this is just something uh, a clarifying um, definition so that we can uh, more easily determine uh, footprints in some cases where the building is non-traditional. And then here, let's see. We added grade surface average finished, uh, which is a term, again, that appears, I believe, in our definition of height. Um, so something, uh, so that it can be clear to a developer or uh, someone who is trying to figure out where their average grade is, exactly how we expect that to be ascertained. And then I believe there's one more. So in landscape area, we've added to the definition that areas on the tops of buildings, walls, and planters, or other similar areas do not count as landscape area for the purpose of minimum landscape area requirements. This is something that we have been doing, um, but we have had, I would say, 
at least one large development, um, but uh, maybe more asking, for example, if they could count their green roof as part of their minimum, basically open space landscape requirement, or by planting, you know, moss or something on the top of their cement brick wall, can that count as open space? So we don't count those now, but we wanted to be clear um, for when those questions come up. So we're proposing to add that to the definition. Um, so again, we have a number, uh, there are more pages and they are all full of um, floodplain definition changes. And um, yeah, uh, I can answer any questions, thanks. Council Member Volan. I got a couple of questions. First of all, um, why was the fraternity and sorority language stricken? You said it was moot or mooted. Uh, what mooted it? Well, I think, I'm sorry Mr. Rooker wasn't able to be here tonight, but I'm pretty sure that it was related to the UJ80 case that we had. The, the, the what? Sorry, UJ80 was a um, uh, another party in a case that we had related to a use on North Jordan a number, uh, a couple of years ago. Does um, UJ80 have a meaning? It's just the name of the company that owns the building. Okay. Um, and so... The definition was, or the use specific standards were related to that case, and then we ended up prevailing in that case. Um, additionally, and Mr. Robinson may correct me if I'm going down the wrong path here, but as well, there was legislation this year to um, make some changes to how we uh, regulate fraternities and sororities. And so I think, um, I'm sorry I didn't get the details today, that uh, legal determined that we do not, we no longer need the use specific standards. In other words, what you're saying is that because we are covering the regulation of fraternities and sororities elsewhere in code, it does not need to be covered in the UDO? I think the thing that the use specific standard was working toward has been adjudicated separately and outside of the UDO, and so they don't think that the use specific standards are needed any longer. They don't think that what is? I don't think that they're needed any longer. I didn't hear the term, the use. The, the use specific standards, which is uh, what we're taking out from fraternity. Okay, maybe I just need a brief explanation of uh, what a use specific standard is with respect to a fraternity or sorority. In other words, uh, sure. I'm to go back to so, that this page. is what we'd be removing, I, and I'm happy to read it to you. If a fraternity or sorority house that has previously been officially recognized. Oh, slow, slow down. You don't need to read the whole thing to me, okay. just if you can summarize it. Excuse me for the interruption, if you yeah. could reference the page number. Sure, it's page 78 in your packet. Okay. So what the gist of it is, what, what is the gist of this language? The gist of the use specific standard language is that uh, it has a way for fraternities or sororities that are no longer actively affiliated with universities to be legitimized by the city because our definition indicates that they have to be affiliated. Okay, and so the, the decision said that uh, they, that we can, we know, I'm confused as to what the upshot is. Are you saying that um, we no longer require fraternities and sororities to be affiliated with the university in order to, to live together? There is legislation that I don't know if it has been passed yet or not that's being proposed this year that will, um, we will still be able to ask them to show affiliation, but there will be a caveat added that it, we, they may be able to show affiliation with a national organization as opposed to a university, in which case we won't, this won't matter anymore. Where in code? would our regulation of such situations be found if not in Title 20? The definition and use are still there. Just the process for them to be able to legitimize themselves once a university is no longer acknowledging them will be gone because they won't need it anymore. So we won't have any kind of process to validate their affiliation with a national organization? we will, st I believe, still be able to validate that ourselves. Without need for code? Correct. Okay, that's my first question. I can hold if there's other questions. Yeah. Councilmember Piedmont-Smith. Um, yes, I saw uh, in here something about um, 
gas stations having to offer 50% of their pumps uh, in non-traditional fuel. Um, and I was just curious if that has been, uh, if compliance has been good with that, because I, you know, when I get gas, I, I don't notice that, but it probably, you know, a lot of stations were grandfathered, so. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, so this is part of what the change is asking to do. Currently in code, um, that is only a requirement in the ME zoning district. And so we are proposing to pull that out and have that be for any gas station. So we haven't dealt with it yet. We've had discussions with people about it uh, and haven't received a pushback, but we haven't had one come through. Remind us what ME is? Mixed use employment. Okay. So that's very limited. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Additional round one question, please. Okay. Let's go to round two. Council Member Volan. On uh, page 86, I barely caught it as it blew by, but um, let me find it here. So it said, um, it defined area of special flood hazard, and it said for purposes of floodplain regulations, it's the land within a community subject to a 1% or greater chance of being flooded in any given year. According to what authority? In other words, who is determining that the land has a 1% chance or greater? Sure, Mr. Grula can probably answer this better than I, but I believe that it's the state who does that, uh, but we'll see what he says. Uh, thank you, uh, Eric Grulick, Senior Zoning Planner. Um, so all of the, the sections of the, this amendment that deal with the floodplain were taken verbatim from the state's model floodplain ordinance. Um, so these definitions and these words are what was basically given to us by DNR of their recommendations of what we should incorporate. So this definition is already in DNR's uh, Flood Control Act, which defines all of the floodplain regulations. Um, so that's where this, this wording and verbiage comes from. So, I mean, that's what I figured. Uh, it was either that or federal, but uh, where in the code is it explained that this is a state standard and not, say, Army Corps of Engineers? Um, so it, it, doesn't, it doesn't, our code doesn't specifically state that because um, we are just reiterating what is already in the state code for that. Um, so, it, yeah, our, our code is basically just adopting their language. We're not, you know, referencing it specifically. They want us to fold it in. Can you see, though, how, I mean, it jumped out at me. It's like, well, says who? Um, can we say says who somewhere in the code to say all standards in these definitions below are according to the DNR? I mean, there's got to be something to which it's pegged, and it's not self-evident. Um, yeah, I can, I can look into that. You know, we've had in, in the past, you know, DNR, you know, they were somewhat flexible in the past of us um, modifying the floodplain ordinance and working into our code. Um, and so anytime we want to change something that is different than exactly what they give us, we want to make sure that they're okay with it. So if we were to put in a reference, I just want to make sure that DNR is okay with that. I don't want to change what they're recommending. I just want to explain to people who are trying to read the law, says who. Sure. Um, yeah, we can maybe put that in the beginning part of yeah. this and kind of the, the That's introduction what I'm for. or something for the. And I would be happy to sponsor an amendment to make that improvement for clarity. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think we can we can probably do that in the, the beginning part of that. the floodplain ordinance. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Additional uh, additional questions on Ordinance 2305. Seeing none, let's go to the public for comment. Uh, um, could I see a show of hands in chambers as to how many people would like to offer comment? Mr. Lucas, could you extend our invitation on Zoom for 2305? Yes, if there are members of the public that want to comment on this item, please let us know by raising your hand in Zoom. Uh, you can find that raise hand button in your control bar under the reactions tab or the more tab. You can also send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to speak. Okay. I'm not seeing any requests here in chambers. Mr. Lucas? No takers. Okay. Seeing none, let's come back to council. Council Member Volan. Mr. Lucas, uh, if we want to see this explanation included, this would be an amendment. Um, what is our, the process open to us? Uh, amendments uh, need to be in writing, so we would need to get the, the language that you'd like to propose down uh, in, in writing. Uh, any amendments uh, to any of these ordinances have to be returned to the plan commission for their consideration. Uh, so a, uh, a reason for the amendment has to be given, 
uh, to the plan commission uh, kicks off uh, another period of time, I believe 45 days for the plan commission to uh, adopt or reject the amendment. Uh, another possibility is to fold this uh, potential language into a future round of UDO updates. These are brought to you regularly. Um, I believe there may be. Uh, yeah, we're, we're part of what we're doing tonight, not in this ordinance, so I'm sorry, I know it's confusing. We maybe just should have brought you one big ordinance is updating the floodplain language. So not just the definitions, but the entirety of the section in chapter four. So you can see on the screen here, and it's on page 130 of your packet, there is a section in, in the floodplain provisions that we got from the state called basis for establishing the areas of special flood hazard. And then it discusses like where that information comes from, what map, um, you know, the different zones, and that it's, you know, those updated by FEMA. I think this answers your question, Mr. Volan. Um, which uh, I see, see, I'm on page 130, C general standards. Yeah. One basis for establishing the areas of special flood hazard, yeah. <coughs> so which, is it A, B, So C? I believe it's, it's both, but um, I think A, yeah, so, so it's, it's A and then B and then C is, you know, if there wouldn't, were not to be published FEMA maps for your location, what you do in that situation, you know, it lays out that the, where they come from which flood insurance rate maps, you know, when those are dated, and... Um, and this is new language? Yes, so we had similar language previously, but this is all new language from the state of how they would like it to be discussed. Okay, um, uh, okay, yeah, so in other words, it, it was contemplated, it is there. Yes. I see uh, another authority coming to the podium. Scott Robinson, Director of Planning and Transportation. Uh, Council Member Volan, um, we'd be happy to, to address maybe your reference uh, in a future amendment, but our coordination with the state, um, and I believe Eric can correct me or if I'm not, uh, there's a little bit of an urgency or timing issue with uh, the notification. Um, we were actually went through a review, a review, I believe, back in 2020 um, which at that time we had already brought forth the prior model code and they said, hey, your model code needs to be changed. Um, for lack of better communication, we're kind of behind the, the eight ball in incorporating their new model code. Um, so I don't, I think what you're asking would be a problem, but I would be concerned if we would delay. No, 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 I, I, I understand your concern and I'm not trying to delay it. Uh, okay. I think Ms. Scanlon basically is saying that this issue was addressed in chapter four and the definition uh, was in chapter seven or section seven, whatever. Um, so it's it basically, it precedes the definition and sh it should be, okay. Yeah. So I mean, no, this, this is what I was looking for. Okay. So uh, I don't think there needs to be an amendment. I appreciate the, I, I figured one of you would know where the reference was. I just hadn't seen it in this ordinance because it's uh, in the next ordinance. And to be clear, I'm open to amendments, but if uh, we want to mess around the floodplain, I would prefer let's push that off for another. As long time. as the definition precedes, I mean, as long as the, the, the explanation precedes the definition, then we have, it's in the code. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you all. Additional questions? Seeing none, is there any final comment on Ordinance 2305? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Council Member Rosenbarger? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Scambaluri? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Sims? Yes. Smith? Yes. Volan? Yes. And Clarity? Yes. Thank and, that, and that passes 9 0. Thank you. Madam President, I move that Ordinance 2306 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of the motion to introduce, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Madam Clerk, will you please read? Ordinance 2306 to amend Title 20 Unified Development Ordinance of the Bloomington Municipal Code regarding amendments and updates set forth in BMC 2004. 
The synopsis is as follows. This petition contains amendments in Chapter 4 related to design requirements for uses in the UDO. There are 55 amendments identified. I move that Ordinance 2306 be adopted. Second. Thank you. Ms. Scanlon, and, and just a friendly request, if you could offer us the page number that you, where you're working at any Great. given moment, that would be really helpful. Thank so. you. All right. Um, the Plan Commission heard case Z00623 at its March 2023 hearing and voted to send the petition to the Common Council of Positive Recommendation with a vote of 8-0 as amended. The Plan Commission voted to remove, to remove the proposed changes to Table 04-10 in order to have time for additional information to be gathered and for discussion. Uh, so this petition tonight is related to Chapter 4, um, dealing with amendments of details related to design requirements for uses. Again, uh, as always with Chapter 4, the amendments vary greatly. Um, so I will go through those, but I will briefly uh, discuss them here as well. Um, there are amendments related to uh, design for front entries, for front setbacks, um, requiring alley access uh, for multiple districts, as well as our mixed-use downtown district, uh, if it is adjacent to an improved alley, um, clarifying some standards for our affordable housing incentives, altering architectural requirements in the mixed-use and residential districts, uh, which we did in conjunction with um, local architects here. Um, altering screening requirements for um, electrical and other such equipment on alleys, altering signage allowances uh, related to drive-through uses, um, clarifying existing uh, other existing signage language, um, exempting City of Bloomington uh, signage from sign standards, um, as well as clarifying, um, as I mentioned before, front setbacks, um, and this time for some non-conforming structures. Again, the amendments also add the required state of Indiana floodplain management language um, and address a number of landscaping issues. Uh, we worked with the senior environmental planner, the um, environmental commission, as well as the urban forester and other members of the parks and recreation department um, on entirely new species tables. Um, so you will see those there. Um, updating street tree um, uh, total requirements um, for sorry, for the total of trees and also location, um, excluding the use of plastic netting, uh, which uh, has been something we've been working on um, with local contractors for a while, clarifying native plantings to be required for green in infrastructure, um, and doing some other changes for uh, landscaping updates. So again, um, 55 amendments, and I'll go through those here, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, so I am on page 126, and this is the beginning of the red line for this particular ordinance. Uh, you can see here, we are in table 04-6. Uh, there was a front entry um, exception, setback exception uh, created um, another time that we updated the code. I can't remember if it was during the full update or after. Uh, again, with discussion with uh, one, a local architect, um, we are proposing to expand that to uh, districts R3 and R4. Uh, currently um, only allowed in R1 and R2. Um, and then I also mentioned a second um, front setback uh, change that we're proposing. Um, we sometimes see uh, existing structures that don't meet the first, uh, don't meet the front yard setback requirement. Um, so being able to allow vertical additions for those um, if the uh, structure is setback equal to or greater than um, the median front setback of the houses on either side. So if it can be done in character with the area, uh, allowing um, the house to have an addition of a second floor uh, without requiring a variance. And then here clarifying that for parking and building setback purposes, uh, Interstate 69 is not considered a front, um, which is something that we do policy-wise. Okay, next page here, 127. This is where we put in um, the uh, prohibition against plastic netting. So we see plastic netting used for a number of things related to site development, including uh, erosion control, but most commonly um, basically under what would be considered permanent landscaping. Uh, and so we have been um, requesting that people leave that out of their um, site plans and uh, landscape plans that we see, but we wanted to codify it so we can um, 
so that we can prohibit it uh, because it doesn't go anywhere. It just stays in the ground and then you know breaks up and uh, is not good for the environment. Um, so that's one we've been uh, wanting to put in for a while. Okay, so this is page 128, and this is where the new floodplain um, regulations start. So again, uh, formatted as well as we could, so thank you to Mr. Grulick for doing all of this work, um, into our normal format, um, you know, having the purpose up front and the different sections that, uh, but trying to use the uh, guidance that we got from the state because we have to make sure we include everything that they request. Um, so working within their bounds, um, but trying to put it into our structure. Um, and I don't think, it seemed that a lot of what they did this year in the update was more about kind of restructuring how they're getting out the information as opposed to changing it. Um, and so uh, it was, it's kind of uh, reworking terminology um, as opposed to changing how they are doing the regulation. So for example, we do have a floodplain development permit here, um, uh, guidance on how to get that started. We did that with the uh, major update and then just guidance on how to administer um, the documents that our floodplain administra administrator is responsible for um, helping along in the process. So this goes on for quite a while. I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next thing. And if, again, if you have specific questions, you can let me know. Uh, I'm going to page 157. Uh, this is our improved alley access, um, which is currently applicable in the R3 and R4 zoning districts, um, expanding that to R1, R2, RM, and MD, so that a driveway accessing the street shall be prohibited if the side or rear setback is accessible via an improved alley. So if you have an alley that you can use for your driveway in a new development, uh, requiring that that be done as opposed to having another street cut on the street. If you have it, for example, a platted alley that isn't improved, then this standard doesn't apply to your property. On page 158 here, uh, this is the only incentive change uh, that we had that I mentioned. Um, this is basically uh, related to affordable and senior housing. Um, these two regulations uh, don't kind of make sense together. They're supposed to be separate, but there was never an or here. Um, so we wanted to clarify um, that it would be one or the other. So we ad are adding an or uh, in between A and B under three on page 158. Page 159, again, this is uh, related to alley access as well. Um, so um, adding the uh, MD zoning district, which we add, which we are proposing to add in the uh, other amendment that I mentioned, um, and then also for multifamily, um, taking out the requirement that says that uh, if you are using alley access, you will be limited to a 40 foot in depth and 20 foot in width pad, basically for parking. It just is not functional, um, and most of the multifamily we see developed has. Um, it either will have parking in the building or a small parking lot that could still meet all of our other requirements but can't meet this. This is kind of an uh, antiquated way of looking at it, and so we're proposing to take that out. Okay, this is page 160 is where this starts at the very bottom. We, um, in consultation with some local architects, um, looked at the architectural requirements. Uh, it's called building design in the code, and it discusses, one of the things it discusses is materials. So um, you can see here a more detailed description of what types of metal can be used um, as secondary materials in our mixed use districts was proposed by the group, and we accepted uh, that change to include in the proposal. We also worked with them on um, kind of clarifying, redefining what, what a module would be. So when we are looking at the architecture for a building, what requirements do they have to do and kind of breaking that building up and allowing um, for design elements to have the building read as separate buildings or as uh, less of a large mass uh, than we sometimes see. 
So working with them to add in those changes as well as changes to the primary pedestrian entry requirements. This is at the bottom of page 161. Um, and this is really more adding in some more technical, um, adding in some more options for what could be done to highlight a primary pedestrian entrance. Uh, so we have that here in the mixed use districts as well as uh, those similar changes in the residential districts for um, multifamily in the RM and the RH. So those go through page 164. So now we are looking at our changes in uh, 2004, 20.04080, which is the landscaping, buffering, and fences section. Um, the first section here, uh, this is page 165 near the bottom. Um, this is related to um, street trees most commonly. So the current regulation says trees shall be planted at least 10 feet from sanitary sewer, water service lines, and natural gas lines. So through the project uh, that Parks is doing with bicentennial bonds uh, for replacing and updating street trees in the downtown area and in other places, it has come to light more and more over the last couple of years that this regulation, especially in our pre-developed areas, is unrealistic. They wouldn't be able to replace trees if they were meeting this requirement. So we worked uh, with the Parks Department as well as with CBU um, to try to kind of come to a compromise about how to regulate, uh, regulate this issue of um, the intersection of street trees and public utilities. So our proposal, uh, again, in conjunction with those departments, is that large canopy trees, which is our preference for street trees, um, can be planted, shall be planted, <clears throat> excuse me, at least 10 feet from public sanitary sewer, water service lines, and natural gas lines. But if you're using medium or small trees, they can be as close as five feet. And then if you actually needed it to be closer, you could you know, make a written request to the director and then he would work with the relevant departments to see if that was appropriate. So uh, kind of giving more, um, more options for being able to have more trees in these areas um, that we otherwise right now technically do not have. The second change you see here is um, a verbiage change uh, proposed by a senior environmental planner moving to a tree crown as opposed to a tree canopy when discussing um, projection over the right of way. Um, and then the last two here are again related to kind of incorporating the urban forester and officially allowing um, him or her to be able to uh, be in on the decision about um, what is appropriate uh, based on um, widths and characteristics of the tree plot, um, as well as uh, what kinds of trees uh, to be planted. Okay, so we've seen this page already, but now we're looking at the EF and then the distribution section. So this is page 166 in your packet. Um, these are proposals from the senior environmental planner um, to add uh, these as um, standards for all landscape plans. One, that all green infrastructure facilities um, shall be planted with only native seed and or plugs, and that all landscaping is required to be installed and inspected prior to issuance of recommendation for final occupancy, and that it gives the department the ability to uh, pr uh, allow extensions for weather-related or other unique circumstances. So for the green infrastructure, we don't currently do that. We encourage people to do it, but it isn't codified, so we don't we require it. Um, for installation prior to occupancy, we do this as a matter of practice, basically so that a, a inspection, I mean, we, we want that to be um, done, excuse me, before final occupancy is recommended, um, but we just wanted to have that codified so people could understand that that's gonna be the process. The expectation is that you're done, and then if you can't be done because of a reason um, outside of your control, we're, we're happy to discuss that with you. Um, and then uh, Ms. Thompson also recommended removing um, this, this regulation related to distribution, um, feeling that it was no longer necessary. Okay, so still on page 166, uh, under species identification, clarifying um, that, that when we're doing the final inspection, either the plants need to be labeled or some sort of purchase order needs to be submitted so that we can um, confirm that what is required on your uh, landscape plan has in fact been installed. 
uh, and then changing the um, verbiage again from invasive plants to prohibited plant species, um, which I think is the preferred nomenclature now. And then for species diversity, increasing the diversity for um, projects with 20 or more trees by allowing only 20% for maximum per genus, which is currently 25. Um, Ms. Thompson also proposed to remove this um, pollinator habitat requirement. I'm, I think partially because uh, we have um, expanded the species list so much and included uh, a lot of plants that um, can will help to meet this purpose without having to explicitly require it separately. And now we're at the top of 167. And um, under two, this is, uh, again, just a nomenclature change. So instead of calling them flowering perennials and grasses, we will now be calling them perennial forb species and graminoids. And then you can see here under E, clarifying that the caliper for a tree is a minimum. Okay, here on page 168, um, this portion of code, alternatives authorized and alternative landscape plan, it has not been substantively changed, uh, just um, the section kind of moved around, uh, uh, which I think made sense. It was um, labeled oddly, and so Ms. Thompson recommended that we make this change, and so uh, just adding it all under B. Um, so that's what we're proposing to do there. Here on page 169, removing the reference to parking lots uh, under the street tree requirement because street trees are not planted around parking lots. Um, those are parking lot trees. Um, and then um, for interior trees, uh, indicating that in the new tables, um, there are trees listed as street trees that can be used as interior trees, but not those that are in parentheses. And then again, renaming the tables just going to shrubs and then forbs. And then uh, many of the next pages are the actual updates to the tables. So these um, updates were made, I think I left one group out, so I apologize, uh, with Environmental Commission as well as the Tree Commission. Um, so the Tree Care Manual has historically or for some time had its own list. And so one thing that we were working on with parks um, with this update was um, instead of how it has worked in the past, the tree care manual is going to reference the UDO and then the tree commission will work with us on our annual update to make uh, changes and work with um, Ms. Thompson and the environmental commission so that everything can kind of live in one place and uh, you know everyone can know what to expect and there can just be one list with information. So we think that's gonna be really helpful uh, and we are very appreciative to them um, for coming to that um, agreement with us. So again, prohibited plant species. These lists um, are quite extensive. Um, I think I would say Ms. Thompson said, you know, they have a lot more options than they have had in the past, um, not for the prohibited plant species, but for the uh, species that we do want. Um, so trying to uh, make it clear and easier for um, developers of all sizes to be able to meet our requirements. Okay, so on to street trees. We're on page 186 of the packet, uh, about halfway down near the bottom. W currently, um, for street trees, a minimum of one canopy tree shall be planted per 40 feet that you have abutting a right-of-way. Um, we are proposing, so this, is, this regulation is for number only, so figuring out how many you're putting in. So the number now will be based upon, um, in this proposal, one large canopy tree for every 30 feet, and that if you, for some reason, for utilities or other reasons, need to use medium or small, you need to use two trees for every one large that you're replacing. So this is for count only here. And then further down at the top of page 187 is the separation requirement. So trees can be no less than 10 feet from one another, 
um, and they should not be planted more than 30 feet apart. But we have put in an exception here um, when separation exceeding 30 feet is required because of constraints of the site, such as utility or driveway location. Uh, so that's something we run into. We've always had a minimum and a maximum, um, but in some cases, they have not been able to meet that maximum, and then we're kind of in a weird gray area um, where then we're, we have not been able, we're not sure how we would handle that. So this is how uh, we're proposing to fix that situation. And then here, uh, again, a recommendation um, from Ms. Thompson that all street trees shall be planted, stabilized, and mulched according to the UDO and the administrative manual. So we will get guidance from the Tree Commission and Urban Forester uh, for a spec, basically, for how they would like the street trees to be planted. And that will be in the administrative manual um, for anyone who is developing. Okay, so we're on page 188, and we are, as I mentioned before, taking out the reference that buffer yards are in addition to uh, building setbacks. Um, so that was done in the first ordinance as a cross-reference uh, for this um, regulation. Um, we have found that on small lots requiring the buffer yard and the building setback, uh, you know, leads to more space than is necessary um, and discourages redevelopment of those lots. Um, so we are proposing that they not be cumulative. You will still have the same amount of required impervious um, surface um, or permeable surface, excuse me. Um, so you won't lose that. Uh, we are just proposing that these two things won't be separate. And then here, to kind of clarify how we are regulating buffer yards, we're adding prohibited uses. So buildings, parking areas, swimming pools, or dry aisles are not allowed within the buffer yard. So clarifying that the buffer yards are expected to be open um, for uh, landscaping. I'm on the top of page 189. Um, we are changing this word setback to width here for buffer yard treatment. Uh, just clarifying that it's not a setback, um, the buffer yard. Um, but we do have a minimum width. And then again, taking out the reference to that being cumulative with a building setback. And then we are going uh, away from a use space buffer yard table and um, going back to a zoning district based buffer yard table. So we added the use space buffer yard table, which you can see kind of crossed out here at the bottom of 189 uh, when we did the update. We have found that it's uh, more difficult to administer, I think, than the benefits we're getting from it. Um, because, for example, if you're next to a vacant property, it's hard to um, um, con conjecture what's going to end up being there. Um, so we are proposing to go back to a district-based. Um, and again, you know, obviously, with more intense buffer yards, uh, buffering intense uses, especially adjacent to less intense uses, um, and we are not proposing to reduce the um, width or um, density of those buffer yards, only that they will be based on um, district. All right, the next proposed change is at the bottom of page 190. This is for situations where we have parking lots um, that are immediately surrounded by sidewalks. So uh, shrubs are required around a parking lot within five feet of the parking lot. Um, that is not possible if you're surrounded by a, parking, uh, by a sidewalk that's five feet wide. So this allows for those shrubs to be put on the outside uh, in situations where having a sidewalk immediately adjacent is preferable. On page 191, um, minimum plantings, this is for trees that are in islands or on bump outs or in caps. Um, this is uh, designating that those trees are their own requirement, that they're not counting towards something else. So in a parking lot situation, you have parking lot perimeter required um, trees, you also have interior trees, and you also have um, island trees. So we're just uh, clarifying here um, that those are separate from the other numbers you need to meet so that we're increasing the number of trees within the actual parking lot, um, which of course over time is good uh, for shading effect of the parking lot. Uh, 
Okay, uh, this is at the bottom of 192, um, and this is related to ground-mounted mechanical equipment um, within 10 feet of an improved platted alley that that will not require screening. So the way the screening requirement works now, you have to screen your ground-mounted mechanical equipment from adjacent properties or so that if other properties can see or if there's right-of-way. Um, we have found time and time again in the downtown that there is not enough room to do that and just um, practically does it make sense to require screening for, for example, a Duke, um, uh, a Duke facility on the back of your lot when it's on the back of an alley or, or when it's facing two alleys. Um, so we are proposing after working with, um, with Duke Energy to have this be the solution um, and this also will meet their requirements uh, that we developers run up against um, for spacing for Duke as well. All right, page 193. We're almost done, kind of. Um, 193, proposing to exempt City of Bloomington public signs uh, from the signage regulations. So public signs are already exempt from requiring a permit. Uh, so we do not permit public, uh, we do not require permits for public signs from any government. Um, but as you can imagine, the city of Bloomington puts up a lot of signs, and so we would like to just officially exempt them from signage regulations as well. As I mentioned, uh, some changes to the drive-through use signage. This is at the bottom of page 194 in your packet. Um, this is. Uh, something that we're proposing that signs for a drive-through shall be allowed to have 20% as electronic reader board um, and shall be exempt from the landscaping standards of regular freestanding signs. We have seen quite a few, especially in the last year, um, proposals for new drive-through signs that are digital. And you could just drive, or if you go to Starbucks or any place basically in town, that has been able to modernize their drive-through within the last three or four years, they are visually showing you your order. Um, and that technically is not allowed by code. Um, but it's obviously where the um, uh, technology is going. So we are trying to write in uh, something to allow that to a degree. Um, so electronic reader boards, you know, sometimes could maybe feel disruptive, but we feel like in this situation where it's immediately adjacent to the drive-through and visible by that person in the vehicle, that um, it can be done um, usefully and uh, without disruption to the surrounding uses. So at the bottom of 194 and at the top of 195 is where we are addressing those um, those requirements, so a maximum of 12 square feet. Um, so this would be like for the sign that you're driving up to at the ordering location for your drive-through. Here we have some uh, multifamily dwelling um, signage standards, and I believe that these are, um, this is syncing the multifamily signage allowance across our districts. So syncing the mixed-use districts with our more intense um, <clears throat> residential, the multifamily and high-density multifamily, so that they'll be the same. And then in the MN zoning district, our least intense mixed-use district, clarifying that wall signs um, in a multi-tenant center are for individual uses or tenants, because we use the word tenant um, quite a bit in code as well. And then um, also allowing for um, one sign for multifamily dwelling uses in that district where currently none are allowed. And then the last one I believe is in the mixed use downtown, clarifying that not only that internally illuminated signs and electronic reader board signs are prohibited on freestanding signage in the mixed use downtown zoning district. And that's it, I can answer any questions. Thank you. Come to council for questions. This is on ordinance 2306. Council member Piedmont Smith. Yes, thank you, Ms. Gallen. Um, I uh, had a question somewhere in there. There was um, some there were some revisions to architectural standards, including um, uh, for mixed use and non-residential districts. It clarifies the type of metal. Um, 
the primary pedestrian entrance, the exterior facade modulation. And it, I saw, I think it was page 164, where 30% um, of the um, exterior wall can be uh, transparent glass. Is that, and I think that was a, that was a decrease from 50%? Uh, yes, let's see. Um, regular pattern of transparent glass consisting of a minimum of 30% of total wall facade area uh, for residential uses. Hold on, sorry, I'm just trying to. In the, the previous paragraph, it says a minimum of 50%. Oh, correct. And, right. So that's so been changed to, be, to non residential. Yes, so 50% across the board, and now we're separating them for 50% for non residential, 30% for residential. I think the feedback we've gotten is that that is a, like, a kind of a reasonable amount for the first floor for that particular type of use, um, where we want more glass for a commercial so that you can kind of interact with the space and see what's going on, but that for residential, allowing slightly less uh, is still um, impactful on, it, it's, it's still a good um, kind of interaction, but allowing like slightly more privacy and that it's like more obviously not commercial um, by allowing the 30%. Um, I understand that. I, I just, I'm wondering, um there have been some multifamily uh, housing buildings that have, um, you know, met the requirement with, with glass, um, you know, to the requirements, the, the purpose, I believe, is to have some pedestrian interest, right? And, um, but I'm thinking of like Stage Yard on South Walnut. You, it has a lot of glass, but there's no interest because you're looking at a hallway. <laughs> right. So I'm wondering, is there any way to require I mean, if you're going to have glass that it, it's actually there's something to look at behind the glass. I mean, I know some of it could be an actual apartment unit, in which case they could draw their blinds and you would have the same situation. But I just wonder if, if it's going to be glass onto a public area, is there any way we could require something more interesting to be going sure, on? Sure, I think it's a great <laughs> question and one that we deal with or you know have tried to address in different ways by you know not allowing it to be vehicles for example and then you know not allowing it to be dwelling units in certain areas of town where you can't have the parking in front to try to um, um, to try to encourage those spaces to be public or uh, something of interest I'm not sure how easy that is or that we've quite figured it out um, that's something that we kind of still look at because I mean stage George is a good example it's meeting the requirements but there's nothing there um, so yeah I mean I think it's a point well taken I'm not sure I don't think this addresses I don't think this is maybe necessarily specifically related to that question I mean meaning that depending how much glass is there you know but it is something that we try to work on but have maybe not hit quite yet okay something to think about yeah all right thank, thank you, you. Thank you, Councilmember Rollo. Thank you, Ms. Scanlon. I had a question about our policy, which we've had for a long time now, a few years, <clears throat> of requiring native plantings. And um, so I'm concerned about the, the temporal nature of that. That is, how long are the plantings required to be maintained? The code requires maintain in perpetuity. And do we inspect in perpetuity? <laughs> well, we don't have enough people to do that, I would say, to be, to be candid. We would like to. We talk, you know, we talk about ways to try to do it in the most efficient way. Um, it ends up normally being either a redevelopment situation or an enforcement situation. So I see. Um, because I'm aware of some developments that have come in, and they put in native plantings, and then they don't tend them, and then they clear it out and they put vinca in or something right you know um so uh that, that in your view that's a function of personnel yes we just need more inspectors to do that yep. and and what and is there what is the penalty is it a, is it a fine yes so we could we would if if we were you know, called to a site for some reason and saw that they completely taken out, for example, a rain garden that was required, we would send a notice of violation, we would give them a deadline, say put it back in to you know, noting whatever approved site plan they had, uh, certificates of zoning compliance, and then if they didn't, we would start finding them. Yeah, okay, 
All right, thank you for that clarity. Additional questions for round one. Council Member Volan. I've got three. Uh, the first is uh, on page 165, you talk about replacing the word uh, canopy with crown. Can you explain the definition? I unfortunately cannot. Uh, that is was a recommendation that we got from uh, Ms. Thompson, Senior Environmental Planner. Um, I believe the idea, my understanding is that canopy would maybe be more thought of for more than one tree, where crown is specific to uh, one at a time. Okay. Second question is um, on page 192, you talked about ground mounted mechanical equipment. Can you give us a better idea of what that means? Is my little sprinkler that just, you know, waters the yard, is that ground mounted mechanical equipment? No. So ground mounted mechanical equipment, for example, uh, would be uh, the box that, that the apartment building needs that is Duke's um, service. Uh, I'm not thinking of the right word. What's it called? Yeah, service box. I mean, the utility box, the things that they need, that's what ground-mounted equipment is, and that's what um, we're trying to address. One, that we feel like sometimes we've required screening in situations where, like, we're not really helping anyone by requiring them to put the fence up around it. There's, to, to, to put what around By it? requiring them to screen it. It's not really giving a benefit to the community. So, I mean, when they talk about a box, like the service box, I mean, could this be like boxes that you see on corners that have been painted by artists, that kind of box? And yes. is, is the outer case of the box itself the screening or that there needs to be some kind of a, of a green uh, wall around it? Yes, some kind of wall or fencing is currently required. Okay, um, so how big is the smallest ground mounted mechanical equipment that must be screened? I mean, is it this big or is it like Duke energy sized. I, I just don't have a sense of, of. Sure, I would say. Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, Eric Grulick again, senior zoning planner. Um, so Steve, some of the examples are in the section right above this. Uh, in A, you know, it talks about the types of things that are the ground mounted that we're screening. So power supplies, transformers panel boxes, air conditioners, those kinds of things. So there's not a minimum size, um, but the things we typically run into are HVAC units. Uh, you know, the Duke electrical transformer boxes that you kind of see scattered around sites. Oh, I see. Um, okay. So those are the typical things that we, that we run into. Okay, I, I didn't look at paragraph A, so that's fine, thank you. I'll have one more, but I can wait. Other questions? Seeing none, please go ahead. Okay, I wanted to go to page 194. Uh, where we were talking about um, uh, walk-through and drive-through uses. So I, I don't know exactly where this is the right place to ask this question, but it's been my personal experience on, on uh, two occasions, one at a fast food drive-through restaurant downtown and one at a bank downtown, where the uh, business uh, closed its doors to walk in traffic at least half an hour, if not several hours, before they closed their business to drive through traffic. And they claim that it's illegal to serve a pedestrian walking through their drive through, but there's no other way for the pedestrian to access the business without getting into a car. Um, uh, is there anything in zoning code uh, that regulates this? And if not, is there anything in code that regulates this? And uh, if, if so, is, if, if not, is this the appropriate place to change that if I believe, for example, that a pedestrian should not be denied access to the business simply because they're not driving through? Uh, no, there isn't currently anything, and I don't think that that would be a zoning Title 20 issue. But I, I'm not sure where that would fall. Perhaps, Mr. Lucas, do you, do you know where that would fall? Uh, I've, I've heard that same comment before. I'm not sure where uh, businesses are prohibited from serving walk-up uh, customers. I'm happy to look into it further. They don't say they're prohibited. They simply say that their insurance company does not, so does not cover them if people walk through. So you're, you're thinking of a requirement that they do serve? I think it should be illegal for a pedestrian to be denied service simply because they're not in a car. 
or that the business has to maintain the same hours for walk up. They have to f figure out what it is you know, they have to do, but they can't deny service to people if they're open simply because they're not in a car. Uh, I'm not sure whether Title 20 would be the right place for, for that or not. I'd, I'd suggest for the research before that type of, of uh, proposal was brought. Well, the, the reason I ask, I think, is also because if, if it's true, let's say, that, um, I mean, I, I can understand the logistical reason why businesses would do it, but if they're not required to build a walk-up window that would be safe for the pedestrian to approach, then, uh, you know, our zoning code has basically enabled this behavior. So uh, it, would it be... Um, inappropriate to require that a drive up window also provide uh, access to a pedestrian so that uh, they can't claim that it's, I mean, like, shouldn't we regulate that in zoning code? I think the, I think the only way we could regulate it, right, would be if you all decided that we wanted to require businesses to put in pedestrian walkthroughs. We don't require businesses to put in vehicular drive-throughs, but they do them, so we want to have regulations to make sure that they make sense, especially with the signage and, like, you know, uh, width of driveways and stuff. Um, so, I mean, we, we aren't requiring them, but we know they're going to happen, so we want to regulate it. I think the only way to address the walk-up would be to require that. I mean, we do see that happening. We have two permits right now in the department where businesses downtown are adding walk-up windows. Um, and that's not something that we require, but I think that would be the only way to do it. And, and are those windows regulated uh, right now by zoning code? Walk-up windows? Like only other regulated in the way that we regulate the materials uh, and design of the exterior. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. thank you. Additional questions before we go to public comment? Seeing none, let's go to public comment on Ordinance 2306. If there's anyone in, in chambers, please go ahead and approach the podium. Mr. Lucas, could you extend our invitation on Zoom, please? Yes, if there are folks on Zoom that would like to comment on this item, please let us know by using the raise hand feature in Zoom. You can find that by clicking the reactions button or the more button in your control bar, or you can send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to speak. And let's start here in chambers, please. Hi, I'm Greg Alexander. Um, I just about jumped out of my skin when I heard um, Volan's question there. Um, very exciting. Uh, it's a severe problem. Businesses that don't accept pedestrians, it's, um, it's indefensible and you simply shouldn't allow it. Uh, completely ban all uh, drive-throughs. The business owners have shown that they simply can't be trusted with that responsibility and um, drive-throughs aren't actually important to the city. They're not important to our community. They don't actually deliver a good community good. It's miserable to stand in them in cars. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lucas, any takers? Not that I see. Okay. Any additional comments here in chambers? Seeing none, let's come back to council for additional questions or comments. Council member Piedmont Smith. Yes, I just have a small request and I don't know if this is worth acting upon, but um, there are two um, sections in this uh, in this ordinance where the word gauge is spelled wrong. It's it's both the places where the metal si um, exterior finish is further described. Um, I don't know if we can just fix that, or if we need an amendment, then I you know I'll just <laughs> wait till next time. But just thought I'd point that out. Where are we? Page 161 and page 163. Any comment, Ms. Scanlon, or no? Oh, they're definitely spelled wrong. Do they? Uh, I think it's um, a yeah, Scrivener's a, a sta Yeah, someone else's decision how to handle it. Okay. I, I will say uh, either the uh, we, we can live with the uh, typo um, or the council can amend it. Um, uh, an amendment would send this back to the plan commission. Uh, so um, another option, I, I don't know that we've done this before, if, if it's uh, an obvious uh, uh, 
mistake uh, that's non-substantive uh, could be treated as a Scribner's error. There could be a note added that it was corrected after the council voted on the, uh, um, the, the ordinance uh, so that it's at least right in our codified version of the code online. Good. Additional comments or no? So can we, can we choose that avenue and just do it as a Scribner's error? It's that not worth doing an amendment. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'll talk to the clerk. I don't know if we've done that before, but if, if the clerk added a note to the, uh, the past, uh, assuming this ordinance passes, add a note to the legislation, and then the version we send to the codifier can be the corrected version. Okay. If you can do that, that's great. If not, I think yep. people will figure it out. Thank you. <laughs> Councilmember Volan. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate uh, the point of the question I just asked. It should not be allowed in this city uh, that a business can close its doors to pedestrians but still serve people in cars, no matter whether it's half an hour or all night long. Uh, but if a, if a fast food restaurant at a bank can do it, uh, then anybody can do it. And it doesn't, it, 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 it diverges from our the intent of our comprehensive plan. Um, I, I think that uh, Ms. Scanlon is right that it's, prob and it's probably not uh, a Title 20 issue unless uh, there needs to be um, uh, specificity that there has to be a pedestrian walk-up that is uh, safe, uh, that's installed with any drive-through. Um, and so I still think that there might be a Title 20 uh, aspect to it but I'm looking forward to working with uh, council staff to develop an ordinance. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's overdue. I've, I've thought about this issue for years, and uh, I'm glad we had a chance to talk about it tonight, but it simply shouldn't be allowed, that you should be able to access a business if it's open, no matter what uh, transportation method you use to get to it. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Flaherty. Thank you. Uh, thanks to staff for all the work on this and other ordinances. Uh, I just, in particular, wanted to uh, give kudos for the uh, changes with respect to alley access and when there is an improved alley available, uh, that that's the required point uh, for a, a drive cut or parking. Um, just statistically speaking, the, the more drive cuts we can eliminate from uh, the sidewalks and, and streetscape, the safer pedestrians will be. Uh, so I appreciate that change. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions or comment? Council Member Rollo. I have a comment. Um, I support the uh, landscaping uh, requirement changes, um, but if they're, they're to have meaning, it seems that we have to have uh, code enforcement. And so, although this isn't necessarily, it isn't, isn't pertinent tonight, um, well, perhaps it is in, insofar as this is our code, should be maintained, but if there aren't inspection personnel to do that, um, then it's moot. What's the point? Um, and I've seen a lot of sites where this seemingly occurs. Uh, it's not only important for nat native biodiversity in terms of the native plantings, but it's particularly important with non-native invasives, which then use those sites as to, to spread. The proper gills uh, spread from that into surrounding neighborhoods or, or the environment generally. So it seems we've got to get a handle on that and have the adequate personnel come budget time um, to enforce this code. Thanks. Thank you. Additional comment? Seeing none, let's move to a vote. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? On 20, Ordinance 2306. Oh. Sorry, yes. I got happy. Okay. Uh, Piedmont Smith? Yes. Scambaluri? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Sims? Yes. Smith? Yes. Bolin? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. And Rosenberg? Yes. And that passes 9 0. Thank you. Madam President, I move that Ordinance 2307 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Yes. Madam Clerk, will you please read? Okay. 
Ordinance 2307 to amend Title 20, Unified Development Ordinance of the Bloomington Municipal Code regarding amendments and updates set forth in Bloomington Municipal Code 2006. The synopsis is as follows. This petition contains amendments in Chapter 6 related to processes and procedures in the UDO. There are 21 amendments identified. Thank you. Madam President, I move that Ordinance 2307 be adopted. Second. Thank you. Ms. Scanlon, stay strong. All right. <laughs> Last <laughs> one. <laughs> All right. We are on page 210. Uh, we are looking at uh, ZO0723. The Plan Commission heard that case again at its March 6th hearing and voted to send the petition to the Common Council with a positive recommendation with a vote of 8 0. This, uh, this petition is related to Chapter 6 Administration and pr Procedures. The amendments cover a variety of topics. Multiple amendments extend the appeal time, um, excuse me, appeal period from five days to 10 days for various department or commission decisions. Um, unnecessary or duplicate regulations are removed. Um, when a change in use review is required for a grading permit is clarified. Uh, site plan expiration timeline, again, is made more explicit. Um, we updated some outdated language. The demolition delay expiration timeline is made explicit. Uh, language related to grading permit exemptions is clarified, as well as language related to lot line shift expectations. Um, the abandonment period of a site that's no longer being used is synced at a year um, with another part of the UDO that is already 12 months. Um, and then expansions that are exempt from site plan review um, are altered uh, in order to be cumulative and existing language related to the update of adjacent pedestrian facilities in a limited compliance situation is updated to reflect past practice and policy, and there are 21 amendments. So I will go through those now. Again, we're on page 210. Um, this, on this page, uh, we are extending the appeal period for a hearing officer decision from five to 10 days. We're gonna do that multiple times in this ordinance. Um, recommendation from the legal department. So instead of having five days from when we send you a letter, which you may not get you know, until the third day, now you have a little bit more time to decide if you would like to actually appeal. Um, and uh, so we think that 10 days is more appropriate. Uh, this section is, um, excuse me, on page 211. Um, this is related to uh, removing this requirement um, where it says um, that the changes that you're proposing, for example, to a site plan, that we would um, try to determine whether or not they were minor um, related to whether or not they're necessary to meet, meet conditions of approval or commitments. Uh, the way that it's written, you have to meet all three of these, and uh, we don't think that the second condition is actually even um, necessary. We haven't um, had an applicable situation, so we're just proposing to remove that. And then again, here on the bit bottom of page 211, changing a five day to 10 day. Okay, and then under minor site plan review, bless you, this is the one um, that Ms. Piedmont Smith was asking about. Um, so when we're determining whether or not uh, a petition for a development or a redevelopment needs site plan review, um, we also have to determine whether or not that review is going to be minor site plan, which is staff level, or major site plan, which goes to the plan commission. Um, so we have tweaked these lists over the years um, that they, since they were adopted in um, 2020, and um, enough has been changed and added. Uh, so you can see here, for example, development that contains 20,000 square feet um, or less of new non-residential gross floor area, that would trigger a minor site plan review, or if you were doing a development um, with 50 dwelling units or less. So then if you're going over those thresholds, then you do a major site plan review. Um, additionally, number two already um, addresses expansion and alteration. So number five, which says expansions, alterations, or modifications that increase the gross floor area of an existing structure by 10 to 25% will be captured in developments that are adding um, units or uh, non-residential square footage um, in the examples that we've seen thus far. Uh, and so 
if number five were to be triggered in the examples that we've seen, one of the others is also triggered. So it's either a change in use um, or an expansion or alteration um, of the lawful non-conforming site feature uh, that falls below the major threshold, major site plan threshold. So we can talk more about that, um, and Mr. Grulick might be able to help me out on that one. Um, but basically, we determined that that one was no longer necessary. We've been kind of trying to whittle these down over the years so that it's clearer and easier to understand. So I don't know if I helped that today, but um, number seven, um, currently all petitions that require a grading permit get minor site plan review. We want to clarify that this is if they are doing site plan improve if site plan improvements have been triggered. So for example, we've seen grading permits um, where it is just earth movement, for example, working on a detention pond. So they are um, excavating more than 2,500 square, or sorry, 2,500 square feet. Um, and so this technically also requires minor site plan review, but there are no standards to review because they're not actually doing any improvements. So just clarifying that in grading permits, in that type of situation, we won't be doing the um, extra site plan. Um, Sinking this language here where it says flood way fringe taking out the way because that was one of the changes um, from the uh, state code, changing that term to flood fringe. And then at the bottom of page 213, um, clarifying that uh, if you would like a site plan extension, you need to request it within the year that your site plan is good. Um, we just felt the language wasn't quite clear enough there, so wanting to clarify that. Top of page 214, changing a uh, five day to 10 day. Again on 215, changing a flood way fringe to flood fringe and then um, expiration, uh, excuse me, expiration of approval. Again, clarifying that you need to request your extension within the year and changing developer to petitioner as sometimes you know the petitioner isn't the actual developer. Okay, so we're looking on page 216, um, and this is related to demolition delay. So just changing some language that was left over from the old code, for example, saying non-residential zoning district, we now call those mixed-use districts, or changing any single family uh, district to listing the R1 through R4. So doing that on 216. And then removing this publication requirement for demolition delay, uh, the publication, any publication requirements that are done are done through hand. Um, so this uh, reference is not something that we, we actually have done and they handle all the publishing requirements. So we need to take that out of code so that that's clear. And then again, clarifying how long a demolition delay approval is uh, valid. So explicitly stating, stating that the approval um, expires within one year, we're currently, code only says you can't apply for two within a year for the same project. Um, so clarifying that that is uh, that it is good for the full year and then expires. Um, so now I'm on the top of page 219. Um, again, just clarifying some language here, uh, listing the uses for which land disturbing activity is exempted from a grading permit instead of saying on an individual single family lot, listing those uses um, such as um, single family dwelling and the plex uses that we group together as the typical uh, uses on a potential uses on a single family lot. And then clarifying under number three that um, for the foundation exemption that we included, I believe last year, uh, that, that that is only for if you are only doing foundation work. Okay, so we're at the bottom of 220. And this is language related to uh, a process that we call lot line shift. Um, and so it's basically when you have typically two parcels and you want to move a line between them, you don't have to go through an official subdivi subdivision process. The state exempts that process from subdivision control and we can process it in this other way. Um, something that we run into is uh, what requirements do those lots have to be held to because code requires that any new lot meets code requirements, which we discussed a little bit earlier. So this is clarifying that uh, we want the lots to meet the minimum zoning requirements of chapter two and that um, 
that is, you know, our very basic development standards such as setbacks and uh, minimum lot size um, so that we aren't opening up chapter four every time uh, we're doing a lot line shift. So it's on in here twice. It's at the bottom of 220 and at the top of 221 because one is related to platted land and one is related to land that has not been platted, but they are the same regulation. Okay, at the bottom of 222, an appeal to plan commission, um, uh, switching from five days to 10. An, an administrative appeal, so from a decision, for example, most of our administrative appeals are related to notices of violation we issue, so switching that from five days to 10 as well. And then, as I mentioned previously, um, saying that if you have a non-conforming use, we will consider it abandoned after 12 months, uh, which syncs with our definition of use abandonment of. Got a couple more here. Uh, this is related to our triggers for limited compliance. Um, basically, you will have to do some sort of uh, site, site updates if you're doing a change in use or um, expansion, enlargement, or relocation. This is for non-residential and mixed use um, or reestablishment of a site that has had a conforming use that's been gone for a year. Um, we exempt um, expansions, alterations, or modifications that are smaller than 10%, but we have seen on a couple of sites where a project will come through smaller than 10%, so they don't have to do site improvements, and then three years later, they apply for another expansion, which is smaller than 10%, so they don't have to do site improvements. So we're adding in here that they will be cumulative basically since the UDO went into effect in February of 2007. So we will be tracking those, and if another project comes in and you've crossed the threshold of the 10%, then you will have to meet limited compliance requirements. I think there's one left. Oh, this is the last one. Um, this is page 226 of your packet. Um, number eight, pedestrian facilities. This, again, is in a limited compliance situation. So when you're moving into a building that already exists uh, and um, doing a change of use, for example, you have to do some updates to the site. And one of those updates for a long time has been that if your uh, curb ramps adjacent to your parcel um, do not meet Americans with Disabilities, the Americans with Disabilities Act, you have to bring those into compliance. Um, the language here wasn't very specific, and more recently, we have been interpreting it um, after discussions with legal that it's basically the entire sidewalk, the, the entirety of the pedestrian facility needs to be brought up to code, uh, or needs to be brought up to the ADA standard. Um, we are proposing to uh, codify the original intent of what the regulation was. Um, because in a limited compliance situation, it's not a new build. It's often you know, someone renting a building from someone else, a, a smaller business, um, and it can be quite uh, prohibitively costly to do those updates. Because for example, uh, one of the requirements in the ADA is a cross slope, um, and so if you're building that you're renting has a public sidewalk in front of it that can't meet cross slope, this the way the code is written now, it's your responsibility to replace that. Um, and we feel like that's a kind of a scale issue based on what you're, what you're really doing there and what you should be responsible for. So we're proposing to codify that uh, to be specifically to the curb ramps. Um, and that's the last one I have, so I can answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you. Questions? Council member, ooh, Council member Piedmont Smith. Yes, so that very last point, the um, pedestrian facilities, um, I'm trying to find what the context of that is. So it is limited, so it's a non-conforming site. Sure. I can um, give you an, a good example that I think some people are familiar with. I think I know which. Okay. Is it the Tandem Birth Center? Yes. So we had a business go in on I always say they're on, on East 3rd into an existing building and uh, limited compliance, change of use situation. So they had to make some landscaping updates. I think they uh, initially were gonna have to add an island, um, small scale updates to their small site of which they didn't own. 
uh, and you know they have to add bike parking, they sign inch has to meet requirements, um, dumpster enclosure has to go in. So there are things stretching all throughout chapter four that they are required to um, bring up, not all, not all the way to code compliance for some of them, but to address. And in this situation, when they had their um, sidewalk looked at by, by a professional, it didn't meet cross slope, so code require was going to require that they take out the entirety of the sidewalk and put it back in. Um, and through lots of discussion with um, different parties, it was may, determined that that may be a little uh, that the scale of the, that requirement might be out of step with with the kinds of development that will be triggered uh, that will trigger these uh, standards. Um, and in that case in particular, you know, the sidewalk had only been put in, you know, however many years, not that many years ago, it's a state sidewalk, it was just going to be very complicated for what they were trying to, you know, accomplish at that site. Um, so that was definitely one that made us uh, discuss it internally. And based on pa past practice, there was a similar um, requirement, but it was uh, targeted towards those ramps so that there could be safe crossing uh, at vehicular um, at vehicular points uh, along the pedestrian way. Okay, thank you for describing that. Yeah, appreciate it. Additional questions? If not, I'll take a turn. Okay, seeing none. Uh, Ms. Scanlon, on page 211 in the section on flat committee under minor changes allowed, um, without the need for a new per petition, provided that the planning and transportation director determines that the proposed changes and then we're striking the phrase, are necessary to meet conditions of approval or commitments. You said that we weren't, it turns out that wasn't applying very often or at all. What kinds of conditions or commitments were contemplated when that language was first included? That's a great question. Um, do you uh, thank you. Um, so, so that particular section, um, you know, anytime, I'm sorry, uh, Eric Grulick again, uh, senior zoning planner. Um, so, you know, whenever a petition comes forward, if there is an approval uh, condition, condition of approval that says you have to change something, obviously they have to change something. Um, you know, whether it's uh, an, an entrance, you know, whatever aspect, you know, more shrubs, um, you know, what, something to meet code. Um, so what we had seen time and time again, though, somebody's like, oh, I want to change the color of the side of this building from this to this, or I want to, you know, change the size of a window, something that was inconsequential, but it wasn't necessary to meet a condition of approval, so this wouldn't even have allowed them to change one single thing. Um, and so this, this change gives us more discretion, you know, mostly leaning on uh, the last one, you know, would not significantly alter the function, form, intensity, character. You know, if somebody wants to change a color, if they want to change, you know, a window size or some minutia, um, you know, they wouldn't have been allowed to do that before. But with this, you know, it gives us more flexibility. You know, the presence of the word and, you know, ties everything together. Um, so it was just not giving much flexibility oftentimes as we would see between a plan commission hearing and a permit, you know, there are, there are gonna be certain changes that happen sometimes. Thank you. Additional questions, council member Piedmont Smith. Yeah, just to tag on to that, um, unfortunately the word and is being deleted with this change and it would be helpful to leave it in. Another minor thing, Scrivener error. just, you know, <laughs> y'all are cursing me, I know, but that's something to maybe add back in later. Additional questions before we go to public comment? Seeing none, then let's go to public comment. Um, anyone in here in chambers, please feel welcome to approach the podium. Uh, Mr. Lucas, can you extend our invitation on Zoom, please? Yes, For if there are members of the public that would like to comment on this item, please let us know by using the raise hand feature. Uh, you can do that by clicking your uh, reactions tab or your more tab in the control bar, or you can send us a chat to let us know you'd like to speak. Thank you, and I'm not seeing any commenters here in chambers. Mr. Lucas, do we have any takers on Zoom? I don't believe so. Okay, in which case, let's come back to council for additional questions or for comments. Seeing none, let's move to a vote. Madam Clerk, if you will, please. Yes, council member Piedmont Smith. Yes. Scambellari? Yes. Rallo? Yes. 
Sims? Yes. Smith? Yes. Volan? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. And Sandberg? Yes. Thank you. That passes 9-0. And that takes us to legislation for first readings. Madam President, I move that ordinance 2308 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That the ayes have it. Madam Clerk, will you please read? Ordinance 2308 to amend the traffic calming and green waste program incorporated by reference into Title 15, tra Vehicles and Traffic, of the Bloomington Municipal Code regarding amending the traffic calming and green waste program incorporated by reference into Bloomington Municipal Code Section 1526020. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance adopts an amended traffic calming and green waste program. The traffic calming and green waste program sets the standard for the prioritization and placement of neighborhood traffic calming and related traffic control devices and requires a consistent procedure for resident-led and staff-led processes. The amendments to the program include the addition of common council action as a required step in both the resident-led and staff-led processes. Thank you, and let's plan to take that up next at our regular session on Wednesday, May 3rd. Madam President, I move that Ordinance 2309 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. That passes. Will the clerk please read? Ordinance 2309 to amend Title II of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Administration and Personnel regarding the creation of a joint city-county human rights commission. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance approves the changes to Title II, Administration and Personnel, of the Bloomington Municipal Code in order to create and empower a joint Bloomington-Monroe County Human Rights Commission, which will replace the city and county individual human rights commissions. Thank you. And let's plan to take that up next at our regular session on May 3rd as well. So. That brings us to our second of two periods of public comment for items not on our legislative agenda. If you would, here in chambers, please go ahead and approach the podium. Mr. Lucas, can you extend our invitation on Zoom, please? Yes, if there are members of the public that would like to comment now, please let us know by using the raise hand feature uh, in your control bar under the reactions tab or the more tab, or send us a chat to let us know you'd like to speak. Thank you, and let's begin here in chambers. If you would, share your name for the record, please. Thank and then you. you'll have five uh, minutes. Sorry. My name is Greg Alexander. Um, we have a north side connectivity problem. Even drivers know about it. They call it game day. Um, for pedestrians and cyclists, it's much more severe. Kinzer Pike has a sidewalk on one side of the street. It's crappy, it's unpleasant, it's dangerous. Um, other than that, nothing, absolutely nothing, except Old 37 through Cascades Park. The right answer is to make connector paths that the neighborhoods up there aren't segregated from each other. For example, there's already a pedestrian bridge over the bypass, but it doesn't connect to anything at all. A couple connections there would let the Arlington Valley Trailer Park residents use that bridge. There are challenges to these connector paths. Hills, money, political will to take the land. But ask any planner. That's really the right way to, to deal it, with this problem. From the very beginning of the Greenways plan, city staff decided on a shortcut. Instead of a comprehensive network of connections, they would simply build a path through Cascades. That had a bunch of disadvantages and only one advantage. Parks and Rec Department was willing. Uh, back then, engineering was within public works. It was simply impossible to get them to expend any resources whatsoever on bike and ped connectivity. But planners knew that Parks is willing to ask for money. They're willing to ask for millions of dollars for bike and ped transportation. And that's exactly what happened. But Parks doesn't actually know or care about transportation, so they ask for the money for transportation. We've already spent about three to five million dollars on the Cascades path, and the result is isolated segments, almost useless for transportation. They don't even connect park properties to each other almost. 
but we still need those connector paths. And even after the Cascades path, we will still need connectors. So I am always looking for opportunities. Last week at the plan commission, the Ridgefield site plan came up for reapproval. Um, that's a suburb just north of North High School. Uh, 30 years ago, the original plan called for a connector path to the school from the suburb. Um, that would turn a, a three quarters of a mile trip into a one quarter of a mile trip. For pedestrians, it is just night and day. Um, it still hasn't been built. And the new site plan it was revised and it deleted the path for two reasons. MCCSC didn't want it. They just don't care. It's disappointing, it's wrong, we shouldn't accept it. And there's a hill. It would be difficult to make the path ADA compliant given the hill. So, you know, just give up. You can hear my blood boiling. I asked the plan commission to restore the path and they did. Those guys aren't as bold as I'd like, but when they see an easy opportunity to improve connectivity, they do jump on it. But it may still not get built because our engineering department will probably veto it since no one will put up the resources to make it ADA compliant. I'm so angry at myself for arguing that ADA compliance isn't important because it is. This should be a priority for the city. Instead of saying no to a hilly path, we should invest the resources to actually make a good ADA compliant path. It's a problem. At this site, it's not even a hard problem. It would just require a new retaining wall. That's it. And we need at least half a dozen more paths just like this one. And there's no plan for any of them. But there's one silver lining. Our planners have finally pierced the walls of engineering and public works and, and funding. And the result is a pathetically unambitious greenways plan. But since it's made by planners instead of park staff, it has two features that were only a vague dream a decade ago. First, it's designed to be a connected network. Second, they prioritize the build out so it starts at the center of the city and works out. That is so much more useful than isolated segments. The downside is the funding's still a joke. And so is the political will. That's you guys. So they have to use existing roads and the only tool they have to make them appropriate for all ages and all abilities is speed humps to slow cars down. And the worst part, it will take at least a decade at this rate to build out the part that's already been mapped out. After a decade, there still won't be anything north of the bypass. So that's why I love the Greenways program and it's why I hate the Greenways program. And it's also why planning staff is desperately trying to find the cheapest and fastest way to implement the Cascades path. Because parks decided after millions of dollars were already spent that the core segment wasn't possible. And everything else is still decades away. So the ball's in your court. Do you care? Does this body care that there's still not a single safe biker ped route to North High School? Still more than 15 years after it was first dreamed up, my oldest is 11. They had already spent a million dollars on the Cascades Trail before he was even born. He's gonna be a freshman pretty soon. Like, that blows my mind. But will there be even a single connection to North High School for bike and ped? Thank you. Thank you. Additional comment on Zoom, Mr. Lucas? Or any here in chambers? Seeing none, that'll close our second period of public comment and take us to matters of council schedule. Uh, yes, just one quick housekeeping item. The council has a scheduled budget advance meeting on Tuesday next week. Uh, that meeting was originally scheduled for uh, this room, the council chambers, on your annual schedule. Uh, the Board of Public Works, I believe, uh, if I have the board right, uh, has a meeting that night as well and would like the room. And so if a member doesn't mind to make a motion to move that to the McCloskey room, we've, we've already got that room set up, and I believe many budget advance meetings have, have uh, been held in uh, conference rooms anyway, so um, uh, just a request to make that uh, motion tonight. Make that motion. I'll make the motion. And so is there I will second the motion to move our budget advance meeting to the McCloskey room. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, that passes. Our budget advance next Tuesday evening will be in the McCloskey room. So, any additional matters on scheduling? Councilmember Sandberg also mentioned, I just wanted to note again that the Jack Hopkins Committee has uh, presentations from agencies scheduled for next Thursday, I believe at 5.30. Uh, so we're uh, looking forward to hearing from those uh, agencies invited to uh, present. Great, okay, thank you so much. 
If there are no additional items of business, I'm not seeing any up and down the dais. We are adjourned for the evening. Thank you. <laughs>